we'll get the meeting start meeting started uh, shortly. So first of all, once once again, good morning and welcome to the first GMAC meeting of 2024. Um, before we begin, for the record, we have 30 of 38 GMAC members in attendance. Therefore, as a GMAC designated federal officer, it is my pleasure to call this meeting to order since we have a quorum. Separately, after each of the subcommittee recommendation presentations, we will hold a voice vote. I will ask members to raise their hands for either a yes, no, or abstain, um, but I'll reiterate sort of the procedures once we get to that stage. For those who are virtual, um, please press the raise hand button on Zoom to cast your vote, um, and then leave your hand raised for the respective vote, and then unclick the hand raise button once the vote category gets tallied. I'll re reiterate this once we get to that stage. So before we begin uh, this morning's discussion, I would like to turn to uh, Commissioner Carolyn D. Pham, the GMAC sponsor for the welcome and opening remarks. Commissioner Gospit Romero will then give live virtual opening remarks, followed by pre-recorded opening remarks from uh, Commissioner Mersinger. The floor is yours, Commissioner Pham. Well, thank you all so much for being here. Good morning, and thank you to everyone who's joined this meeting, both in person here in Washington, D.C., and virtually. I want to particularly thank the CFTC's Global Markets Advisory Committee leadership team. Amy Hong, Darcy Bradbury, Brad Tully, Michael Winicky, Allison Lurton, Tara Cruz, Caroline Butler, and Sandy Call for your continued hard work and commitment to tackling some of the biggest challenges facing global markets, particularly in light of macroeconomic factors and geopolitical dynamics. I especially want to recognize the members of the GMAX subcommittees and the workstream leads who contributed their time and resources developing the recommendations that we will hear today. I also want to thank my team, Harry Jung, the GMAC designated federal officer, and Nicholas Elliott, the GMAC alternate designated federal officer, as well as Megan Tente and Taylor Foy for their tireless efforts and dedication to excellence. And as always, many thanks to all of the CFTC staff who are hosting and supporting the GMAC's meeting today. Looking back, it was just over a year ago that we kicked off the newly reconstituted GMAC. At that time, I noted that it was the 50th anniversary of the Federal Advisory Committee Act, which is the genesis of the GMAC, and the hundreds of other advisory committees sponsored by government agencies. This year, I want to note that it's actually the 50th anniversary of the CFTC's creation through the enactment of the CFTC Act of 1974. I hope that we will be able to celebrate our proud history and to recognize the many efforts of all the CFTC staff over the years who have tirelessly upheld our agency's mission. I also want to note that uh, last year at the Chairman's Awards, we recognized 45 years of service. It's amazing to think about the continuity and the institutional knowledge that we have here at this agency, and I think that's one of the reasons why we at the CFTC try to endeavor and be a good steward of our markets, having that historical perspective. I also want to note that next month is actually my two-year anniversary as a commissioner. And as I was going back and re-watching our confirmation hearing and rereading my testimony, I re realized that more than anything, I wanted to be a commissioner to make a difference in the world and to make our markets better. And through all of your efforts, the GMAC is delivering on what we set out to do. And so thank you for helping me to make a difference in my leadership as a commissioner. Some of the accomplishments that we have done is we have had a global stock take of the most significant issues in global markets where each of you sat here in this room and presented your perspectives. It was truly impressive to have such a broad swath of representation from so many different kinds of market participants and market infrastructures, and in particular, to have the perspective of service providers as well. I believe that when we looked at the recommendations that we set out to do, there was about a dozen over our three GMAC subcommittees, global market structure, technical issues, and digital asset markets. And it's impressive to me that not only have we already done eight recommendations, but there's another three that we will hear from today. And when you look at the recommendations that the GMAC has done, they've touched upon ways to improve the liquidity and efficiency of global markets, including US Treasury markets, repo and funding markets, and commodity markets. We've looked at ways to improve the functioning of markets, what, looking under the hood. And we've looked at ways to further the dialogue, uh, especially here in the United States, 
in providing regulatory clarity around digital assets, and in particular between distinguishing what are financial activities and what are non-financial or commercial activities. So with all of that, I'm very excited to look forward to today's agenda, where we will address a follow-up on our uh, hotly watched Basel III Endgame panel at the last November meeting and the impact on derivatives markets. I'm thrilled to recognize that we will have a keynote from the Financial Stability Board's Secretary General John Schindler on the FSB's priorities for 2024 and the work plan. And to look at the recommendations we will have from each of our subcommittees, uh, touching upon uh, Treasury ETFs as eligible initial margin for uncleared swaps, the transition to T plus one securities settlement and some of the, in particular, cross-border issues that it raises. And then finally, uh, last but not least, the digital asset taxonomy from the Digital Asset Markets Subcommittee. And with that, I want to thank you all again. I'm looking forward to a tremendous meeting, and I'll turn it over to the GMAC chairs. Thank you, Commissioner Pham. We will now have opening remarks from Commissioner Goldstreet Romero. Oh. Yeah. You would have thought after like two years, I would have had that down better. Good morning. I'm so pleased to welcome you to the CFTC for the first uh, GMAC meeting of 2024. And I'm very grateful for the service of the members as well as Commissioner Pham for her leadership of this committee and the CFTC staff. Commissioner Pham, I appreciate um, you talking about next month is two years. And I just had a, a pop-up on my phone of our pictures at confirmation that said two years ago. And it was just such a great time and it's been um, just a great time serving with you and, and with our fellow um, commissioners over the last two years. As I was thinking about um, the GMAC meeting today, I was thinking that I'm always reminded that commodity derivatives markets are truly global markets, global markets that can have local impacts on end users and consumers. And so just as an example, lately I've been following how shifting weather patterns in West Africa have driven uh, cocoa futures to record highs. And then chocolate producers like Nestle have reportedly warned about price increases. So even Cookie Monster recently expressed concerns that the size of his favorite product, which includes chocolate as a key input, is shrinking. So it's important to consumers and end users and everyone else that global commodity derivatives markets function well and are resilient to setbacks. And in many ways, these markets provide opportunities, and that's what I've been focused on, right? They provide opportunities to help manage the one-off global shocks like the pandemic and Russia's war against Ukraine. They provide opportunities to weather stresses from a cyber attack or from climate events. And of course, they provide opportunities for end users to discover prices, manage risk, and plan for future investments. So it matters to end users who are producing food and fuel that these markets are resilient. And it matters as well to regular people who shop at the grocery store and, and heat their home and, and drive their car. So last year, I remember telling you that in order to build resilience, we should expect the unexpected. And by expecting market stresses, the collective we can plan for it. Right? We can build in measures to ensure that there is adequate liquidity in times of stress. We can build in measures designed to ensure market stability, and we can build in measures to ensure that commodity prices are not artificially increased, but instead reflect market fundamentals of supply and demand. And commodity derivatives markets have performed well under remarkably stressful conditions, and I remain very positive about the resilience of these markets. We should always keep our eye on the goal of resilience. In the last few years, the local impact of geopolitical events in global markets has been made clear. We continue to see ongoing impacts on supply chains, transportation, and other inputs remaining from the pandemic. And while the high volatility and high prices of oil, natu natural gas, and wheat caused by Russia's war with Ukraine have subsided, the war continues to impact markets and attacks in the Red Sea have disrupted shipping traffic, including in the crucial Suez Canal Channel, which impacts inputs. 
Additionally, these markets, as we know, have seen local impact from sustained drought during the hottest year on record. And I've met with several CFTC registrants who've told me how they are evolving to manage the changing economic and physical conditions from severe climate events. So given the local impact from these global commodity markets, this is the time to plan for future market stresses and build resilience. And market participants can take advantage of this opportunity while markets perform well to review lessons from the past, forecast future stresses, and review access to liquidity, in particular short-term liquidity. And the CFTC also has opportunities to review lessons from the past and plan for future market stresses and build resilience. The CFTC has proposed an operational resilience role for swap dealers and futures commission merchants that would also help plan for the unexpected including for cyber events or other events that could impact operations. CFTC surveillance is particularly important when falling prices in our markets have not always translated to falling prices for the consumer. And I previously called on the CFTC to shore up its surveillance practice, practices by conducting deep dive studies into certain major commodities during periods of high volatility and high prices to ensure they were not driven by manipulation, excess speculation, or other practices. The CFTC is well positioned to ensure that the prices consumers pay reflect market supply and demand rather than fraud, manipulation, or excess speculation. So global market participants and the CFTC need to continue to work together to expect to the unexpected and plan to keep our markets resilient. That's why I'm grateful for your service on this committee. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Goldsmith Romero. We will now hear pre-recorded opening remarks from Commissioner Mersinger. Good morning. I'm sorry I'm not able to be with you in person for this Global Markets Advisory Committee meeting, but I did want to record this message so I can thank all the members of the GMAC and its subcommittees for their hard work, especially the eight recommendations that you recently advanced to the Commission. The CFTC's advisory committees serve an extremely important role in forming and educating the Commission and CFTC staff on the real world impact of government policies, both here in the US and abroad. I can honestly say I always learn so much from attending advisory committee meetings and the discussions from these meetings help inform my thinking as we deal with various policy considerations. I know you have an ambitious agenda for today including several timely and important presentations and the consideration of additional recommendations. I will be watching the recording of this meeting so that I can still benefit, albeit slightly belated, from the expertise and insight you all so graciously share. I'm looking forward to hearing the discussion around treasury market liquidity, listening to the important address by General John Schindler, and learning from the panel presentation regarding Basel III Endgame. The Energy and Environmental Markets Advisory Committee, or EMAC, that I sponsor, recently held discussions where we heard from multiple stakeholders around the potential negative impacts that some of the Basel III proposals may have on the energy derivatives markets. I'm certain the discussion by the GMAC panel will offer additional perspectives on the potential impact to the broader derivatives markets in the U.S. With that, I will wrap up my remarks by once again saying thank you for your service on this advisory committee. I know this takes time away from your work and your families, so I wanna make sure you know that your input is invaluable. Additionally, thank you to Commissioner Pham for all of the effort and energy she has put into sponsoring the GMAC. Thank you to Harry Jung and Nick Elliott with whom these meetings would not be possible. And last but certainly not least, thanks, thanks to all the staff here at the CFTC who make all this happen. And a special thanks to our telecom team who made it possible for me to record and share this message with all of you today. I'm very grateful for your expertise and your kind assistance in all things at the agency. Thank you, Commissioner Mersinger, and thank you all for your opening remarks. Uh, before we begin today um, on our first segment, there are a couple logistical items that I wanted to uh, mention to the committee members um, in person and virtual. Um, first, if you, if you would like to be recognized during the discussion phase, uh, during today's meetings, please change the position of your uh, place card that's placed on your desk um, to sit vertically and uh, to, or raise your hand and I will recognize you and give you uh, the floor. 
If you are participating virtually uh, on Zoom and you would like to be recognized during the discussion for a comment or a question or need technical assistance, uh, please message me via the Zoom chat and uh, we will handle accordingly. And please identify yourself before you speak um, or signal and signal when you're done speaking. Um, that'll be very helpful. And please unmute your, unmute your Zoom video before you speak and mute both after you speak. And please only turn on your camera when you're engaging in discussion. Um, if you happen to get disconnected from Zoom, um, feel free to reach out on the Zoom chat or close your browser and uh, try the Zoom link again. Um, and lastly, if, for, for those who are using slides today, um, we'll be controlling the slides up here. So um, please just simply say um, next slide and I'll advance the presentation accordingly based on your direction. And before we begin, uh, we would like to do a readout of the members participating virtually uh, so we have attendance on the record. Uh, Perry and Boring, Chamber of Digital Commerce, Isaac Chang, Citadel, Jason Chilapala Steller, Gerald Kokoran, RJ O'Brien, Scott Fitzpatrick, Tradition Group, Steve Kennedy, ISDA, Derek Kleinbauer, Bloomberg, Agnes Co., SGX Groups, MC Lauder, Uniswap, John Murphy, Commodity Markets Council, Chris Perkins, Coin Fund, Thomas Pluta, Trade Web, Andrew Smith, Virtue Financial, Jason Skwankowski, Morgan Stanley, Julie Winkler, CME Group, Dane Twiggs, Cargill, and Kevin Kennedy, NASDAQ. With that, I'll turn things over to the GMAC Chair, Amy Hong. Great, thank you, Harry. It's a pleasure to be here today with Commissioner Pham, the sponsor of the GMAC, and Commissioner Goldsmith Romero virtually. Um, on behalf of my co-chair Darcy and also the GMAC members, we're all looking forward to today's agenda. I'd also like to thank our GMAC members and presenters for their time and welcome all members to share your perspectives during our open discussion. Uh, with that, we will begin the day by welcoming the Financial Stability Board FSB Secretary General John Schindler, who will provide a keynote address on the FSB's 2024 priorities. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the invitation to be here. I'm very happy that the timing worked out that I could be here in person as opposed to uh, trying to do this uh, remotely. Uh, we're always happy to advertise our work, so uh, I'll do the advertising, then you tell me what you'd like to hear some more about. Uh, hopefully there'll be some interesting questions here. The way this is structured is I have a few introductory slides just in case you're not completely understanding what the FSB is and how we work. I think there's a few misconceptions that I'd like to clear up in that uh, introductory remarks. I'll talk a little bit about current risks because it is part of our work program is to always monitor risks. So I want to tell you what we're seeing and how we're looking at those. And then I'll talk about some of the longer term risks, some of the structural things that we're looking at that are part of a work program that's three, four, five years long. Can I have the next slide, please? So I promise that I'm not going to read all the words on all the slides, but this is one slide where I would like to take a little bit of time and just read what's there. This comes from our charter. So this was in 2009, the G20 leaders got together and created us out of the Financial Stability Forum. And if you look at the first sentence of our charter, the FSB is established to coordinate at the international level the work of the national financial authorities and international standard setting bodies in order to do a few things. The words financial stability don't actually show up there. Okay, You have to read the second sentence where it texts, after talking about coordination, it says, in addition to this collaboration, the FSB will address vulnerabilities affecting the financial systems in the interest of global financial stability. So why do I start with that? Because I'm about to talk about my work program, and at some point you're going to look at something and you're going to say, like, that's not related to financial stability. I don't quite understand why that's on the FSB's work program. I get those questions a lot. We had a work program on correspondent banking for a number of years, and people used to say, well, why is that on your work program? It's because the G20 wanted an organization that could coordinate across the standard setting body, so when something falls between the cracks, somebody is still going to work on it. So that's a big part of what we do. Um, that said, we are the Financial Stability Board, so there is usually a link to financial stability in just about everything we do. Could I have the next slide, please? Uh, the FSB's membership, if you look here, 
we are a G20 organization, but we have 24 jurisdictions represented. So we're a G20 plus organization. You've got some international financial centers, Hong Kong, for example, Singapore, for example. But we have ministries of finance, we have central banks, we have supervisory and regulatory authorities, including market regulators. And I think that is what makes us a little bit different from the other standard setting bodies, because we have the politicians or the politicians' representatives there through the financial or the finance ministries. And so when we do something, you can understand that at the end of it, it's got political back backing. We bring it to the G20. The G20 leaders endorse or uh, recommend most of our, our work. There's other people there as well. All the standard setting bodies, the, the major standard setting bodies there, the international and regional bodies like the BIS, et cetera, are there. When people ask me, what is the strength of the FSB? My first answer is always the membership. There's no body that has this type of membership. It's either specific to you know, banking regulators or it's just central banks and they don't have the political backing. This is our strength. Can I have the next slide, please? So what do we do? And this is my last introductory slide. There's three basic functions that we perform, and we can get into the details and how we come up with a list of 35 functions. But we identify systemic risk. What are the risks in the financial system? Then we develop policies, hopefully, to mitigate those risks. And then we follow up to see whether those policies are being implemented and whether they're having the effects that they're supposed to have. And at the bottom, you see a little bit diagram here. The first group, we have a standing committee on the assessment of vulnerabilities, which does that vulnerabilities assessment. That's currently chaired by Nellie Lang. She's the Undersecretary for Domestic Finance here at the US Treasury Department. The, the uh, policy making is done by the Supervisory and Regulatory Coordination Standing Committee, which is chaired by Andrew Bailey, at the, the Governor of the Bank of England. And then this work on implementation is done by a standing committee that we call the Standing Committee on Standards Implementation, or SCSI. It's currently chaired by Ryozo Hamino. He's the Deputy Governor at the Bank of Japan. And it's shown here linearly, and that is true. This is how the work should flow through. But I prefer when we talk about it as like a, a circular thing. Because at the end of this, it's not like we say, well, here's where we are in implementation. We're done. We're out of here. One of the things that SCSI is supposed to do is to look at whether or not we have had the achieve, the, achieve the effects that we had intended to have. If not, it's supposed to go back, OK? This didn't work the way it was supposed to. We send it back to SCAV. Is the vulnerability still there? The worst case is when something hasn't been implemented. We put out a recommendation. Five years later, we're like, look, the implementation is not there. What's going on? Did something change and this risk no longer is there, so you didn't have to implement the recommendations? Or did you just not get around to it? You didn't have the, the support that you needed. So there's supposed to be this nice cycle to this work. If I can have the next slide, please. So uh, a big part of our work is looking at what's going on at any given time and identifying the risks there. We would call these cyclical vulnerabilities, cyclical risks. We also do a lot of work on structural vulnerabilities, but I wanted to start here. Can I have the next slide, please? So I think it's almost a given that anybody who looks at financial stability, they're always going to talk about the tail risk. They always look for the negative. But I think right now, I think it's easy to say that it is a challenging outlook for financial stability. If you look at the line in the top half, it's basically just an indication of tightening, how tight market conditions are. And if you look over the last two years, you see a significant tightening from a low in 2020 to a relatively high position in uh, the current conditions. And if you look at the line below it, this is supposed to show credit growth. And you see this tightening has had a very material effect on credit. You saw credit fall from a double digit rate of increase to a lower than normal rate of increase. So we know that this tightening is having an effect. And if you look at that decline in credit growth, that is actually the second largest decline in credit growth we've had, the only one larger in the past three decades, is the global financial crisis. So anytime you're making comparisons to the global financial crisis, that should make you a little bit uneasy, OK? Could I have the next slide, please? This slide shows another way of looking at the same thing. On the left, again, I'm showing global financing costs. And you can see that big increase in how much financing costs overall. On the right-hand side, we have some measures of debt. And this is looking at FSB member jurisdictions. So how much debt do you have? 
And when you have the cost rising as much as we've seen, a very significant increase, and you see the debt rising both in absolute terms and in relative terms, if you look at it as a share of GP, it's still up modestly, maybe a little bit perhaps. But when you have debt being more expensive and people taking on more, that doesn't tend to end well. You know, at some point, that debt has to be repaid, and you're repaying it at higher and higher rates. So that makes things a little bit nerve-wracking for people in the business of looking at financial stability risk. Can I have the next slide, please? There's pressure building in some sectors, and I'm not going to talk about all of these. You can look at some of our press releases, some of our, our documents to learn more. Commercial real estate is one of those sectors. This is a sector that is sensitive to interest rates, and obviously we've seen this tightening, so that makes it uh, a time when we should be looking at it. But there's also structural shifts going on. The move to work from home, the move to uh, more online shopping, and you can see it in the prices of some of these real estate measures. This is a sector that's been hit. The thing that I want to highlight is more that right panel, which shows who is providing the lending to this sector. I think when I talk to most people, they think, wow, banks are really going to take a hit if this goes bad. But if you look at that, and not to say that banks are, are perfect, but about half of the credit extended to the sector is from the non-bank sector. And I think a lot of people don't recognize that. So this sector has grown over time. The non-bank sector has grown over time. And they're providing a lot of credit. So maybe this will play out differently than it has in the past. Go to the next slide, please. So we're about a year, almost exactly a year removed from the events of March 2023, the banking turmoil. I've included it in this cyclical vulnerabilities discussion because I think interest rate risk, the tightening of financial conditions that I talked about, was one of the precipitating factors, at least for uh, Silicon Valley Bank. Anytime something like March 2020 happens, the turmoil that we experience, we tend to look back at that event to try to learn from it because usually you see things that you haven't seen before, either because the recommendations have shifted the way the market functions, uh, or there was just something you didn't know about. So we spent a lot of time looking at this. We're not alone. The Basel Committee has been looking at this as well. So in terms of international banking standards, they've issued a report on this, and they're doing some further work on it. We had issued a statement saying we might look at the macro prudential elements related to any micro prudential work that they've done. At this point, I don't think there's, there's gaps there that we need to fill. The international resolution framework particularly if you looked the way the banks were resolved in the United States, the way Credit Suisse was resolved, uh, different situations. The Financial Stability Board is the international standard setter for re resolution. This is true for banks, insurance companies, uh, financial market infrastructures. So obviously, when you have resolution, including the first GSIB to fail since the global financial crisis, the first test of the framework that we put in place about a decade ago, we wanted to take a careful look at that. You can see we published a report on that in uh, October of last year. And in another slide, I'll talk a little bit more about some of the findings there. But also in terms of lessons learned, interest rate risk played a key role that was linked to liquidity risk at some of those banks. So we wanted to look at how is that nexus changed over time. Is there also a concern about the non-bank sector? I highlighted to you the CRE, a lot of the non-banks there. Could we see similar dynamics there? So we're doing more in-depth work on that. I think the speed of the deposit runs was quite startling. And I think you've probably seen pictures in the paper showing how this compared to past deposit runs. People had questions about what is the role of technology, what's the role of social media here. So we're doing work on this as well. So all of this came out of our study of the events of last March. It's hard to believe it's only a year removed from that. Can I have the next slide, please? I said I would talk a little bit about the work on resolution. We wrote that report in October, and it laid out some possible future work. Uh, you can see the sort of the four big areas, public sector, uh, backstop funding mechanisms. This was a key component of Credit Suisse. The oper operationalization of bail-in. This was the first time bail-in debt had to be used. You know, what did we learn from that? Are there things that we could do to make the system run more smoothly? Resolution strategies and tools. If you take a look at the Credit Suisse situation, there was a resolution framework in place. They decided to opt for a different option. It worked out. This is good. We should be looking at multiple options for, for banks or other institutions if they have to go into resolution. And then the impact of social media and digital innovation. 
because I won't talk about it elsewhere, I'm going to talk about two other resolution things not related to that event. We're doing work on CCP resolution, which uh, the fo our hosts here are, are very actively involved with. That will come out actually very soon. So uh, take a look for that. We're also doing work on insurance resolution. We publish a list of insurers that are subject to resolution planning standards. And this year, we're supposed to put out our first list. Can I have the next slide, please? And I'm going to skip this one and go to the next one. So I want to talk about these big picture, longer term things. This is actually where we get, we get most of our attention, most of our questions about what we're doing. It's four big areas. There's actually a few others that we could probably list, but these are the four that I'll talk about. The first is NBFI, or non-bank financial intermediation, which is just what we used to call shadow banking, but we've now given this more sophisticated term. Very important part of our work program based on what happened a few years ago. We have also uh, financial risks from climate change. I don't say financial stability risks because, again, this is one of those areas where coordination is important. We've been asked to coordinate a G20 roadmap on this work. Crypto assets, and I would describe it a little bit more broadly, crypto assets, uh, the activities, and global stable coins all fall within this uh, area. This is an area of very active work, and I'll spend a little bit of time talking about that. And then cross-border payments, which is actually one of our priority areas, which is something that I think a lot of people don't know that we're working on. But just in terms of sheer marin power, it's taking up a lot of time and having really tangible effects already, which is great to see. Can I have the next slide, please? Let me start by talking a little bit about MBFI. And uh, I should say that I know my staff sent new slides. So this is a voyage of discovery for both you and I at the same time. I see they threw back in the footnotes that I cut out, which because I said they were just too small to read, but they're there for the record. The slide was a little bit bigger, OK? But you don't need to see much other than what I wanted to show here is that MBFI has grown over time, both in absolute levels and as a share of total financial activity. If you look at that chart on the left, you can see that about 10 years ago, it was 42% of all activity. Now it's closer to 50% of all activity. Okay, so there's been this big shift. That's what you need to take from this slide. Can I have the next slide, please? So what is our work program here? Uh, some very basic statements. Just like we, I believe, we have enhanced the resilience of the banking sector, our overarching goal is to enhance the resilience of the non-bank sector. This is a critical sector. We can't talk about half the global financial activity and say, well, like, well we, we took care of the banks. Let's, let's ignore, ignore the rest. We can't do that. This is critical. Provides incredible amount of benefits. Obviously, you have a commission here that probably agrees very strongly with that, that statement. At least I hope you do. During the turmoil around uh, the COVID pandemic in March 2020, March is becoming a bad month for financial analysis for whatever reason. Let's hope we make it through this month OK. Um, we learned a lot of lessons, whereas in past periods where a shock hits, we often saw the need to you know, lend to banks, lender of last resort. There are a number of facilities set up in the United States and around the world to lend to non-bank actors. We want to take that away. We want to take the need to do that away, I should say. Um, so we needed to put together a comprehensive work program. There's two basic elements of this. One is just including in improving our understanding and strengthening how we monitor risks in this area. It used to be called shadow banking for a reason. We don't have as much data. We don't have as much visibility into this sector. So this makes it a little bit more difficult. And then where possible to put in place policies to address systemic risks. Can I have the next slide, please? This is uh, an attempt to uh, try to summarize some of the things that we're doing here in one slide. A key theme of the work over the past year and into this year is the liquidity mismatch. So if you think of a market for liquidity, you know, in general, in good times, there's a market out there, a market price is set, and liquidity remains in balance. So you have supply and demand in close proximity to each other. But what we've seen in periods of turmoil is that the demand for liquidity spikes. People pull back. They don't want to lend. So you could say that you know, well, it's still working. The price of liquidity is just really high. But in fact, some markets just stop functioning. We just can't get things to work the way they're supposed to do. Now, what are the factors behind this? Well, on the left, there's a lot of sources for this demand in liquidity during times of, of shocks or turmoil. 
On the top there, you see things like liquidity mismatch. I have promised to provide you liquidity for your assets that you had with me, and the assets that I have here don't match that, so all of a sudden I've got to sell. It could be margin calls. You hold assets, uh, you have some sort of uh, derivatives contract, and somebody calls you up and says, yeah, prices have moved against you, I need X billion dollars. Could be currency mismatch, lending in one, borrowing in another, it just doesn't work out. And it's all made worse when there's leverage behind it. That's why I have that big weight there. All of these things contribute to a cycle sometimes where something happens and all of a sudden the market for liquidity just isn't functioning. That's not to say demand is the only side. You can see on the other side of this, dealer constraints. Dealers have told us, well, the, the regs that were put in place X years ago make it more difficult for us to provide at that point in time. Or people have talked about structural issues. We're about to issue some work on short-term funding markets. People have pointed there and said, it's just the way that market funds, it just, it just doesn't work in times of stress. What I can say is that we have done work on every one of the pieces that you see here. Some of them active, some of them already done. Okay. I hope I was able to explain that with that cute little chart. Um, we've tried to make it prettier over time. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. So what are we doing? Um, last year, we put out a piece on the financial stability risks from leverage in the non-bank sector. This year, our members have asked us to turn that into recommendations. What is it that we can do? Is it just data? Is it just that we don't know where this is? Or are there other policy recommendations that are necessary? This will get a lot of attention. It's already gotten a lot of attention. We hope to have a draft of this out late this year, early next year, hopefully finalizing it. A lot of people know that we put out recommendations on money funds a few years ago. And we just recently put out a review of the implementation of those uh, money fund proposals. I think it was last week. A little jet lag, so maybe I'm off by a week here or there. Uh, and I mentioned this work on the structural factors in the short-term funding market. That work is going to come out very shortly. I think a lot of you know that we put out uh, recommendations on open-ended funds last year, along with guidance from IOSCO. So we coordinated that work. Uh, we're doing work now on the data that's necessary to put that into actual practice. I think a lot of people know that uh, the bucketing approach that we recommended, there were some concerns about, well, how do we do this? How do we even measure this? We're doing work to actively try to help the industry to help the industry and others uh, in doing things like that. And then the margin calls. We're about to put out some recommendations on the liquidity preparedness of the market participants for these margin calls, and we'll put that out for consultation soon. Can I have the next slide, please? <clears throat> Climate was the second area that I wanted to mention. We were asked by the G20 a few years ago to put out a roadmap for how we we're going to coordinate across a number of standard setting bodies to deal with and understand all the financial related risks related to climate change. There's four pillars of this, and you can see them in these uh, dark bars, disclosures, data and vulnerability, and I would clump them together, and supervisory and regulatory approaches to this. On disclosures, I think this past year when the ISSB put out its global framework for disclosures, that was a big turning point. The uh, TCFD, which the FSB had sponsored, had been doing this on a voluntary basis. Now this is in a more formal uh, footing. Data and vulnerabilities I linked together. Uh, you know, we are asked to do a lot of vulnerabilities analysis. What will happen to financial stability if X, Y, or Z happens? And what our members have said is, you know, boy, if we could measure this or that, that would be great, but the data just don't exist. So in order for us to do vulnerabilities work, we need data. So these two groups are tightly connected. We put out a report last year. We'll put out another report this year on the continuing analytical work. And I think this is a long-term project. I think we're all at the early stages of understanding this. The supervisory and regulatory approaches. This is, as it might, you might expect, what can supervisors do to better get a handle on this? There's some interesting work there this year on transition plans. This has a very specific... Uh, question that's being asked is, is there information in transition plans that would help us understand the potential future financial stability risks? Okay. If there is, you know, how can we improve transition plans to help financial stability authorities uh, better use them? We're also asked to do work this year for the first time on nature-related financial risks by the G20. So the Brazilians are the chair, uh, the presidents of the G20 this year. They said, can you do a stock take of the supervisory and regulatory practices that are already in place at your membership to look at nature-related financial risks? So it's the first time we've sort of dipped our toes in that water. Could I have the next slide, please? 
Uh, turning to crypto, if you had asked a few years ago what is needed for crypto, I think the financial authorities would have said, well, we need minimum standards that are agreed upon internationally. Okay? We believe that the recommendations we made last year and the guidance that the standard setting bodies have put out based on those recommendations puts in place this international framework. Next, you need consistent implementation of this globally. I can give you all the words and all the recommendations. If you don't implement it, it doesn't matter. And we've seen with past issues in the crypto asset market that there can be one country that holds out and says, we will be the safe harbor here, whether that's the Bahamas, the British Virgin Islands, or somebody else. If you don't have the global implementation, you don't have that sort of resilient financial system that we're looking for. And then the last thing is, this is an area that is moving rapidly. This is not, I hate when people say it's evolving. The crypto asset market is not evolving. It is just every day there's something new. We need to constantly talk about this and keep up to speed on what's going on because there's just so much change. Okay. So, like I said, I think we've gotten to the point where we're on number two. But if you look at that clover leaf on the right, we work together with other standard setting bodies and with the IMF to put together a framework for this because it's not just about financial stability. We're working on the upper left corner there. FATF and others are working in the upper right corner on the market integrity. The IMF is working in that lower right. The micro credential, all the standard setting bodies are working there. We hope that we've got this covered. You know, we're relying on you to tell us like, hey, here's a gap. Hey, look what we just heard. Look at what we're, we've been asked to fund. Can I have the next slide, please? This year, it's all about implementation. We put out these recommendations and anything you can do to help us on implementation. If you have international organizations, international meetings where we could go and talk about this, we are doing this uh, with our own meetings, with our own membership. We have regional consultative groups that uh, bring our membership to a roughly three times the size of it. What would it be otherwise? This is just really important for us. We need to get this global implementation. Can I have the next slide, please? The last of these four big areas that we're working on is on cross-border payments. A few years ago, uh, our members came together and said, you know, one of the reasons that crypto assets developed is that, you know, the cross-border payments, it's just, it's an older system. It doesn't work as well as it should. There are a lot of other reasons for crypto assets as well, but this was one thing that they raised. The speed is slow. The cost can be high. I've, I've lived in Europe on two separate occasions now. It used to cost me 50 bucks to send money. Now it costs me like 45 cents. So we've, we've made some progress there. It used to take me three days to send money. Now it takes me about uh, from 4 p.m. close of business Swiss time to 9 a.m. Uh, U.S. time. That's great. Thank you for all the work you guys have done to make that possible. There's limited access. Some people can't even access this system. And then there's limited transparency. And I have a slide on that. If I have time, I'll, I'll show you that. The FSB membership came together and said, you know, you've got to work on this and make this a more efficient system. So again, there is a roadmap. I feel like we're an atlas now because we have all these roadmaps and collecting them together is what the FSB is. So we're really just a big atlas. We're trying to work with the standard setters. We have a lot of public and uh, private sector partnerships to make this happen. If I have the next slide. <clears throat> I think I mentioned at the beginning that this is one of the areas where there's very concrete and tangible progress. I don't expect you to read everything on this slide. You have it for your reference. The key I wanted you to take away from this is that we have set specific targets for how fast, how much it should cost. We've set them for wholesale, for retail, for remittances. So we're trying to be as comprehensive as possible. We report on our progress on these quantitative targets on an annual basis. We, you know, we only put out our first report last year, but even there we had seen some huge progress from what we had thought the situation was. And I will give uh, one anecdote here. I, I only have a few slides left, so I hope I'm on, on time there. I mentioned that we have these regional consultative groups, and we did a meeting in South America recently where we talked about the progress. A lot of engagement amongst our memberships there, because especially once you get into emerging market and developing economies, this is a big issue. And people were very passionate in the opinions that they expressed. And then as we went to a break, somebody came aside and grabbed me by the arm. I was kind of startled. And I was like, he's like, you don't understand how important this is for my jurisdiction. Because every penny you save is a penny going into the poorest person's pocket. And you know, I think about it from a financial stability and an efficiency perspective. But when he put it that way, it was like, 
wow, you know, the cost savings has a very tangible effect, even on the poorest. And just the way he was so passionate about it, it really, at the time, I got a little bit emotional. I said, wow, you know, we're doing our best. We're going to work hard. But this is one of the things where we've already seen tangible effects, and it's, it's very good to see. Can I have the next slide, please? Again, there's a lot of information here. I don't expect, it would take me 10 minutes to explain everything. This is in our annual report on the quantitative targets. But I want to make one point here. This shows sort of, you know, are we making progress in the speed of the transactions and the transparency? The only thing I want you to look at is those dots, okay? Because it's good when we see the blue and the red occupying most of this area. So if you look at the North American, which is a little bit right of center, you see, wow, there's a lot of blue, that's great. But if you look at those dots for business to business, and um, I can't read it from here, business to personal, you see those dots are really low. That's the percentage of transactions that we actually have information on. So for the very small sliver that we see, we're doing great. But we only see less than 10% of the transactions. We have a long way to go here. That's where I'm reminded that i got to wrap up pretty soon. So I just want you to see this. You can look at this. I'm happy to talk about this in great detail. Uh, there's a huge amount of work that can be done here. And it would increase the efficiency and it would affect people's lives in a very real way. Can I have the next slide, please? There's other work that we're doing that I haven't talked about. We continue to evaluate the effects of the reforms that we do. The G20 has asked us to look at securitization and how the uh, G20 reforms there have had effects. I mentioned the resolvability of central counterparties. We have a work, uh, a work group on uh, cyber and operational resilience. I haven't mentioned it here, but I'm happy to talk about it. It is a priority, but I had to pick and choose what I could talk about today. We continue to work on enhanced auditing standards and accounting standards. We monitor the implementation of reforms. We report annually on the list of GSIBs. And the last slide, if I could have it. Oh, the next slide, sorry. Uh, the last slide I will talk about. <clears throat> We have 60 to 70 projects uh, ongoing this year. We have a public work plan. It's available on our website. You're welcome to take a list, look at that. It has a whole list of what we're working on. This is what we will deliver for the rest of the year to the G20, so at the request of the G20 presidency. So these get a little bit more attention. We delivered to them earlier this year the open-ended fund recommendations that I mentioned earlier. So for the year as a whole, we will have 12 deliverables. And you can see a wide variety of the topics that I've mentioned represented in what we're bringing to the G20. And I'll stop there, and I'm happy to take any questions that you have. Great. Thank you, Secretary General Schindler. I, I found your framing of the cyclical and structural uh, vulnerable, vulnerabilities to be quite um, informative and further enhanced um, by the graphics in your presentation. Um, at this time, we would like to open the floor to questions and comments from the GMAC members. I had a question. Thank you. Very, very good report. Just back to the MBFI topic. Um, how should we think about how you and your stakeholders, um, supervisory and, and regulatory community, are thinking about the jurisdiction and implementation of the standards that you want to put in place, given, obviously, that, that most of these entities aren't, aren't necessarily regulated? Um, is it that you're looking at the conduits, the on-roads and off-ramps into the banking systems? Is that the right approach? Or how do you tackle that topic? Can I go ahead and answer, or are we collecting questions? It's OK? OK. Um, this, is, uh, this is a tricky situation that we often have, OK? Particularly with MBFI, sometimes, I mentioned our membership is our strength. And we do have market regulators on our plenary, on our steering committee, on all of our standing committees. A frequent thing that they'll say is, you know, that's great that you want to do this. I don't have the authority to do that. So it makes it tricky what we can recommend. Sometimes we will go ahead and make a recommendation anyway. Like, we think this is important. If you don't have the legal authority, we'll make a recommendation that said, you know, the legal authority should be given to them. This is also where our membership is important because we have the finance ministers there. So, for example, on the MBFI leverage work that we're doing, right? A lot of our securities regulators have already said, like, you know, the things that we're talking about, you know, I don't have the authority to do this, but, you know, the G20 presidency has asked us to update them on this work. Uh, we will do that in the uh, non-bank, the first element there, enhancing resilience and MBFI progress report in July. We will let them know the political and legal challenges that we're facing, and then the next G20 presidency can choose to take that up. 
So having that political impetus there, when the world leaders agree and re uh, take our recommendations and endorse them, there's an implicit political support for, and we will do what's necessary. That does not mean it always happens, right? We had some recommendations on securities financing transactions where we all said, we have to share more information on this, we're gonna do it. At this point, several years into it, we report on the implementation every year. You can see that there hasn't been a lot of implementation there. So we're in the process of that cycle that I talked about. The committee that looks at that said, hey, there's not a lot of implementation here. Has the risk subsided? Or does the risk still exist and we need to refresh the recommendations? So, boy, this is a tricky thing to do. If you can tell me a way to do it better, let me know. But I do think our membership is a strength here and it helps us a great deal. But it also means that sometimes we have to be careful about what recommendations we make because we don't want to make recommendations that are impossible. Thank you for that question. Um, I, I think we have a question or comment um, online as well from Stephen Kennedy uh, from ISDA. Hi, hi everyone. Um, greetings from Singapore, sir. I can't be there in person. Uh, John, great presentation. It looks like we're having some technical difficulties at the moment. Um, Stephen, we, we lost your audio. Um, if you could hang tight for just a, a minute while we figure this out. In running an international organization, the technology problems are a constant. Uh, as soon as that uh, key committee member wants to make their intervention, they go frozen. It's like, oh, shoot. the whole meeting was staged after that. Well, while we're waiting for Steve to come back online, um, Jackie Mesa from FIA, please. Thank you, John. That was a great presentation. I can't wait to get my hands on the slides. I thought that was a fantastic summary of your work. And given your mission after 2019, I think the FSB has really become um, that coordinator of global standards. Um, impressive body of work, and I think you're tackling the right things. When I, when I looked at the membership, um, there are three members on the committee from the US, and I understand you know, nobody has four. Um, it's been a constant issue. Of course, the CFTC, which oversees um, most of the global clear derivatives markets, uncleared, and on exchange trading, so many of the things you're now tackling, including margin and liquidity, really the key, the key group is CFTC, um, CCP resolution, made, most of the major CCPs are here. Um, I know there was some work, you're doing work on crypto, which most of that in the US will fall here at the CFTC, not the SEC. And then again, on um, some work on commodity derivatives post um, the invasion of Ukraine. So I think of the work, important work you're doing and feels like the CFTC is missing. And I, I wonder if there's some thought going into how the CFTC can have a seat at the table um, during those discussions. Yeah. So you're right. We were limited you know, by our charter, three members per jurisdiction. The US Treasury, the Federal Reserve Board, and the SEC are the US members. That said, all of our committee chairs have the ability to invite, on an ad hoc basis, relevant authorities. So the CFTC is frequently invited. The CFTC is a member of the resolution steering group, so they are on the group that sets the resolution standards. They're not on the plenary that approves them. Um, but for example, when we meet in uh, a few weeks where we're going to discuss those, they would probably be invited as a relevant party to discuss them. So we try to bring them in that way. It's not just the CFTC. Uh, there are a number of European authorities and uh, around the world, you know, there's always somebody who says, well, I should be at that meeting as well. So we try to use the ad hoc process. Is there a formal procedure for changing this? Yes, we do a membership review periodically. We've done that. Actually, we're, we're in the process of completing that right now for our steering committee and our standing committees. And we haven't reviewed the plenary membership this time. But there is a process. It's that, that limit of three that is in our charter. You have to get the G20 to change that before we could formally make a fourth uh, person a member. And not that any other jurisdiction would object, but you might get some people who would object to the United States having four and others not. 
Theoretically. Yeah, right, right. And I guess uh, you uh, there's never been a thought about a rotation system. Um, I mean, we actually do have a rotation system for some of the European authorities when, um, mm -hmm. well, it's a complicated system that when they wanted the, I think it was the supervisory authority to be on there, we created a, a, a rotation. Um, talk to your U.S. colleagues uh, and get them to agree to that rotation, which is what the Europeans did, and we would do it. But I think you'll find that those seats are in high demand. Okay, thank you. I think we're still working through um, the technical issues um, and getting our, our virtual participants back online. Um, are there any other questions or comments in the room? Uh, Dave from FIAPTG. Thanks. Good morning, John, and thanks again for the presentation. I'm Dave Olson. I'm the president of Jump Trading Group, and on this uh, committee, I represent the FIA PTG. Um, it, it was probably not a coincidence that crypto was adjacent to international payments, uh, cross-border payments, uh, in, in your remarks. Um, I'm wondering to what degree the FSB is focused on using some of the digital asset rails as a solution set for cross-border payment frictions and costs. And if you've got line of sight, you mentioned, and I completely agree, the pace with which change is occurring in, in the crypto world. Uh, I think what's a little less publicized is the degree to which major banks and regulated financial institutions are experimenting with private blockchain networks to effectively um, step into the role that is traditionally paid by central banks, uh, especially on payments and FX risk transfer using tokenized assets. Um, but are those, uh, are those two elements starting to merge at all at the FSB, or are you, are you dealing with them as separate initiatives? Um, the, we have very different perspectives on them in the sense of the work on crypto assets was, you know, what is the financial stability angle here? Is there a risk here? So those recommendations were designed from that perspective. And other people, like the CPMI, for example, worked on some of the other aspects of that. Uh, the cross-border payments was a much more practical project, make this faster, cheaper, more efficient, you know, that sort of thing. So there was a different perspective brought to bear. <clears throat> that said, on the cross-border payments issue, getting to your, you know, what about the digitalization of this, is that a big part of it? That is a, a roadmap in which we're coordinating the work of a number of groups. Uh, I would say maybe not coordinating the work of CPMI. We're almost like, you know, co-heads of that group because they're so critical to that piece. Uh, the Committee on Payments and Market Infrastructure, which would be a committee. I don't know if everybody knows all the acronyms that uh, we all speak here. So a lot of those technical aspects, which payment rails are we going to use? How can we make them more efficient? It's actually under CPMI's remit, whereas we're doing a lot more of the transparency work, the partnership with the private sector. That said, we talk to a lot of groups on this, and I've had groups that have come in to speak to me who represent various types of crypto firms and like, we should be a part of your solution for the following reasons. So we talk to all of them, um, but on the technical solution side, I'd say we're less active than CPMI is. So. The answer is sort of like, yes, we're taking it into account. It's not my, my area of, um, uh, of which we're overseeing, but it is there. What the solutions will be, I don't know. I don't know if it's just a speeding up of the traditional rails or if it is a shift to a blockchain or some other technology we haven't discovered yet. Thank you. Great, thank you. Chris Childs from DTCC. Thank you. Um, thanks, John. Great presentation. Um, I'm actually going to ask uh, a question that you didn't cover, so I don't know if this is uh, unfair or not. But since the financial crisis, um, we've been collecting an awful lot of data in the industry around derivative trading. And that was a, as a mandate of the G20 in 2009, I think it was. Um, and this year, we're going through uh, a whole cost and an implementation of rules to harmonize that data with a view to aggregation. Uh, however, there are certain structural impediments and it doesn't seem like that the, um, the infrastructure or, or the, the structural uh, things are being reviewed in terms of uh, how actually that data can be shared on a, on, a, on a global basis. So I wondered if you had a view on that um, and also whether you think the FSB has a role to play in that. 
this is actually a topic of uh, very active uh, discussion at the FSB. Uh, some of the things that I mentioned, I mentioned the, the work on leverage, I mentioned the work that we're doing on open-ended funds and collecting sort of the data for that data pilot project. I mentioned the work on margining. We're about to publish some of our draft recommendations. One of the things that we come across every time, especially in the non-bank sector, and this would apply to the data that you're collecting, is that the data exists, but nobody can share it. And maybe you have, maybe the CFTC has it, but they can't share it with FSOC or with the Fed or the SEC. You know, who knows? So you have an agency with a specific mandate that may or may not include financial stability, that has data that might be relevant for financial stability, but can't be shared. So it's a topic that specifically as we've gotten more and more into the non-bank space, we've been butting up against. So there's some momentum that we haven't made a decision yet to whether or not we should put together something to discuss data sharing issues because it has become essentially a financial stability issue. The fact that these data may or may not exist. If they don't exist, then that's a different problem altogether. But you have the data. You know, I assure you I would love to see the data. You probably can't share that data with me, but there are people out there who could use it to assess the vulnerabilities. So it is a very hot topic. I don't see a quick solution to this because every jurisdiction you operate in is going to have a different legal framework for dealing with that. It's going to be tricky. But as I said, our membership, I think, is our strength. If the members agree that this is important, we will find a way to do something. There's also some work recently on trade repository data and whether or not we can take advantage of it. And they found you know, varying degrees of success in different jurisdictions. So the fact that they found some use for it by looking at their jurisdiction and the data they had access to, not sharing it with us, but saying, we did this little study and we found this, that's encouraging that people are saying, like, we can use this. Boy, it would be great if we could use it more broadly. So if you can come up with a solution, let me know. Great. Thank you. Um, let's go to Adam Farkas from GFMA and then Michael Winnicky from BlackRock next. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, John, for the excellent presentation. I would come back to your comments on structural vulnerabilities and, and the work you are doing on, on, on that one. And I, I try to paraphrase what you said. You said the, the banking system has been taken care of, and, or at least uh, there, is a, there is a grip on structural vulnerabilities in the banking system. And then you, uh, you, you illustrated how the non-bank sector, um, its role and potential vulnerabilities, structural vulnerabilities are emerging and are becoming the focus of the, of the work of the FSB. My question would be how much you are looking at the, let's say, the causality between, between one and the other, i.e. the causality between dealing with the structural vulnerabilities in, in the banking sector causing um, the emergence of structural vulnerabilities in the MBFI sector, and if so, uh, how much of that is intentional or unintended? These are all great questions. Um, first, if I said that banks have been taken care of, I was using that in sort of a caricature sense, like, you know, we're always looking. We looked at the March turmoil of last year and said, like, what can we learn from this? So uh, I think we believe that they are more resilient than they were. So I apologize. My press officer is going to kill me when I get back. Like, why did you say that? But, you know, if the word slipped out of my mouth that way. But I probably expressed it in those terms. Is there a causality here? Uh, I would say almost certainly yes. I mean, as I said, we... You've seen that movement to the non-bank sector. So it makes sense that, you know, if you have made this area more resilient and you do that by, you know, regulating it, supervising it differently, essentially increasing the cost, but intentionally doing so, so that there's a greater degree of care, there's a natural tendency to move to where the costs are cheaper. So yes, there's a, yes, in some sense it was intended, but it was not intended to move it to some place where it was less regulated. It was intended to make this area stronger and now we're working to try to make this area stronger. Now, I think a lot of the things we are encountering were not caused by the shift. It's just that we're now being made aware of them because they're bigger or there's been an increase. I think the private credit is getting a lot of attention now. This was going on before the global financial crisis, but it has grown. So did we cause the non, uh, non-bank credit, the private credit sector to grow? Yes. Did we cause it to have some of the risks that are involved with it? No, it, it was there before. It's just gotten bigger. So yes and no. It was intentional, but it also was not intentional. So our intention is to make the entire financial system resilient. Resources are limited. And we have to focus where we think the greatest priority is. 
great. Uh, well, thank you, John, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, I think a lot of the, uh, the the subject matter you covered will will inspire future work for the market structure subcommittee uh, that we, we co-chair as part of the GMAC. Of the GMAC. Um, one, one question I had is when you're thinking about both the assessment of um, uh, the risk in the financial system as well as methods to address that risk, um, how you think about the balance between um, activities-based regulation and regulation of individual market participants. So thinking about, you know, in the U.S., we have, of course, you know, regulation of CTAs, regulation of uh, fund advisors, regulation of open-ended funds, uh, you know, regulation of, of private funds, sort of a different regulations for different types of entities. But then we also have a great deal of uh, activities-based regulations, such as mandatory clearing, mandatory margining of uncleared swaps. We have the repo clearing proposal uh, that is now final that is moving forward with uh, implementation by the, by the SEC. So uh, when we think about this as a subcommittee, how should we think about um, that, that balance between what you would take an activities-based approach to versus looking at individual market participants? Yeah, this debate hasn't been going on for a long time, has it? <laughs> I spent a number of years at the Fed uh, working on uh, FSOC-related issues. Um, there's no uh, fixed rule that this is going to be done via an entity-based approach and this is going to be done via an activity-based approach. I think when you look at NBFI, you know, we use that to lump together a whole bunch of things. And so I don't think we can ever say, well, for NBFI, this is the rule and therefore every entity should do it this way. We're really talking about activities there. So I think there's a tendency to think about it from an activity-based approach. Now that said, there could be, you know, uh, we're doing this work on leverage and what are the policy options with respect to leverage for a broad swath of incredibly diverse institutions. Could that result in some entity-based recommendations? It's certainly possible. My suspicion, and you know, we haven't even gotten to the, the, the part where we're brainstorming the policies yet. We're still in the gathering what people, what authorities they have, that sort of thing. My, my suspicion is there could be a, a combination in there, but my suspicion is it's gonna be heavily leaning towards the activity-based approach just because of what our members now as their own authorities have, which is mostly activity based measures. Again, I don't know, and there's no fixed rules, but that's just a guess based on what authorities our members already have. So it's sort of like anchoring where they're going to think about how this could be done. Again, don't know. Thank you. Um, I think we are now all systems go with our virtual um, attendees. Um, Steve, let, let's try this one more time. Can, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Oh, that's great. I hope it wasn't. I hope it wasn't the question that I asked. Um, so, uh, John, thank you for the presentation. The, the 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 question that I was trying to ask was that one of the work streams that the FSB has has been engaged in, that's of interest, a great interest to a lot of people in the room, is liquidity preparedness for for margin and collateral calls. There have been a couple of workshops on it um, over the past year or so, and I I guess I'm just wondering. Any initial takeaways from the discussions you've been having amongst policymakers and with market participants? And what's the what's the path forward for that work stream? Will it be a paper or recommendations or? Yeah, I, I can answer this question in vague terms. We are on the verge of putting out the FSB's recommendations on the liquidity preparedness of market participants for margin and collateral calls. <clears throat> so I can I have to be vague about what we're going to say because I don't want anybody to walk away thinking I gave you some sort of scoop. Um, that is part of a bigger work program involving IOSCO, CPMI, CPMI IOSCO, which is another entity all on its own. So this is just one piece of six uh, work streams. We know for sure that we're going to continue to do work after this on the data. You know, all of these work streams identify data gaps that need to be filled. As I mentioned, data gaps is a very important topic for us. Um, so we will continue to look at the data gaps. We will release our recommendations. I'm going to say it's late this month or early next month. I don't remember the date off the top of my head for consultation. So there'll be a roughly a three-month period for comment. And then we will take those comments on board. All those comments will be posted on our website. And we will make a final set of recommendations you know, later this year. Uh, so that's where we are. Um, in terms of the specific recommendations, I probably should just shut up right now before I get into trouble. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? Commissioner. 
Commissioner Pham, would you like to make a remark? I just want to thank you, John, again so much for coming from the G20 meetings in Brazil, stopping here in DC, speaking here, sharing so generously with us this presentation, the time, and the Q&A with the members. It's, it's really very, um, very gracious of you. And I think one of the things I just really want to emphasize is that the work of the GMAC very much is focused on the global challenges that are facing global markets. It is aligned to the work program of the FSB, IOSCO, and other international standard setters that is part of the mandate of the GMAC. And so we thank you so much for bringing that international perspective. Thank you for having me. And my family lives in DC, so I'm always looking for an excuse. So, you know, uh, it's easy to come. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Th thank you very much, Secretary General. Um, with that, we will move on to uh, the next agenda item. Um, I'll hand it over to my co-chair, Darcy Bradbury. Thanks. Thank you again. Um, the next section, we're going to be considering the Global Market Structure Subcommittee recommendation and an update on swap block and cap sizes recommendation that was made at a prior meeting. Um, we're going to have about a 20-minute presentation from Michael Winicky, who I'm sort of blocked by the camera from seeing. Um, and then uh, we will have time for discussion. We regretted that we didn't have much discretion, discussion time at our last meeting, so we tried to build it in this uh, calendar today. Uh, and then we'll uh, take about five minutes to vote in our more streamlined but still new and slightly shaky uh, voting procedure. So we're very optimistic it's going to work better this time. Thank you for your patience all from last time. And then we'll have a 10-minute presentation by uh, Wendy Yoon following up on the recommendations that were made last time. So that's our plan for the next few moments. So let me turn it over to Michael, who's going to present the recommendation uh, from the Market Structure Subcommittee on U.S. Treasury ETFs as eligible initial margin under the uncleared margin rules. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and before I get started, uh, I just wanted to thank the uh, Commission and Commissioner Pham and staff for bringing us all together for the opportunity to present this recommendation, and for Commissioner Goldsmith Romero and Mersinger for the uh, remarks today. Um, I also wanted to thank the Market Structure Subcommittee for all of their work on this recommendation. Uh, the 30 members put a lot of input and effort over several months into this recommendation and the presentation that I have the honor to present, but I uh, wanted to recognize that it's their hard work and really the work uh, of the collateral capital and clearing uh, work stream uh, that uh, are responsible for a lot of the content I'm presenting today. Uh, so to start. Um, the problem statement uh, that we're looking to address, and I don't know if the, uh, the, the slide deck, uh, if we could move to the, uh, to the next slide. Okay, great. Uh, so just to start uh, kind of with a high level framing of uh, the recommendation and the problem we're looking to address. So fixed income ETFs are becoming an increasingly important part of the overall fixed income ecosystem. And they're a driver of a lot of the modernization of the fixed income markets and provision of liquidity themselves. Um, however, under the CFTC's implementation of the uncleared margin rules, it's not clear that fixed income ETFs and treasury ETFs in, in particular uh, are eligible collateral. And so in the, in the face of this lack of, of certainty, there's sort of a chilling effect. Mar market participants have been unwilling to uh, accept or pledge uh, treasury ETFs as collateral, you know, absent this clarity. Uh, and we think that clarifying that fixed income ETFs are in fact eligible collateral would be highly consistent with both the IOSCO principles around what should be eligible mar margin, uh, as well as with the CFTC's own uh, goals and implementation of the uncleared margin rules in the United States. And that this would also benefit market participants uh, you know, like and investors that we represent, uh, as well as uh, markets more broadly. So I'm going to unpack all of that in this presentation. Um, but I wanted to start first with um, background on ETFs themselves and the UMR rules. And then we'll get into the discussion of uh, why ETFs, uh, US Treasury ETFs, meet sort of the requirements and the, the principles of UMR, followed by a discussion of the benefits for, for market participants and markets. So if we could move to the, uh, to the next slide. So I am excited about this recommendation, and there's a lot of enthusiasm in the, in the subcommittee, um, because 
part of what we're doing here is not just addressing uh, you know, a narrow question on collateral, you know, we're really here to fulfill part of the GMAX purpose, which is how can we help the commission uh, keep pace with market evolution and issue recommendations that allow policy to evolve with the evolution of fixed income markets and also look towards international uh, alignment and standards. And so to start, fixed income ETFs, as I mentioned, uh, are playing a really important role in the evolution of uh, fixed income markets themselves. They are creating greater access to fixed income uh, exposures um, and allowing market participants to get access to fixed income exposures in a highly efficient and diversified manner. Um, there's also a, a, not just a benefit in terms of the uptake of fixed income ETFs by uh, you know, end investors looking for exposure, um, but the way that fixed income ETFs operate and their uh, liquidity that's offered uh, on both on exchange and the ability to redeem fixed income ETFs uh, for a basket of underlying securities has actually translated into new trading protocols, uh, particularly in credit markets around portfolio trading, new ways that market participants are transferring risk. Um, so we thought it was important to uh, you know, take a look at fixed income ETFs and, at really, and treasury ETFs and how they fit into uh, existing regulation, and, and here we're focusing on the uncleared margin rules. Um, now, notwithstanding the important role of uh, treasury ETFs, it's not you know, maybe surprising that they weren't directly addressed uh, under the uncleared margin rules themselves. So I apologize that for those in the room, this is uh, very small, um, but if you look at the top chart, um, Really, the, when the G20 were first gathering to discuss the uncleared margin rules in um, 2009, um, that was at the early days for fixed income ETFs. They had been, you know, the initial one was created in, uh, the first one was launched in 2002, but we really saw more uptake and use in later in 2009, post the global financial crisis. Um, and then um, if we look at, you know, the actual dates that UMR was finalized, both the principles by IOSCO in 2013 and then in the US by prudential regulators in 2015 and by the CFTC in 2016. If you look at the, the chart on the, the bottom left, you can see that there's been really a kind of explosive growth in fixed sim ETFs and their utilization, their, their trading volumes, um, subsequent to the finalization of those rules. Um, so really what we're looking to do here is take something that may have been a smaller part of the market, maybe less, less on top of mind when the rules were initially being formulated, and making sure that, that we're, we're now catching up right, to where markets have gone. Uh, now, with respect to Treasury ETFs in particular, uh, I think most of us, the market participants in this room, are probably very familiar with the story of, of uh, fixed income ETFs and maybe more focused on credit ETFs. But since we've moved to a higher interest rate or, uh, environment, there's really been growth of Treasury ETFs in particular. So if we look back at uh, 2023, uh, Treasury ETFs were actually the fastest growing fixed income ETF category with 37% growth in AUM in 2023 uh, alone, and there's also a significant increase in the total volume of trading treasury ETFs, uh, up 18% over year, year over year, with over $2 trillion in secondary market volumes. So this is becoming a much larger market, uh, and that's much more central to uh, fixed income markets themselves. So if we go to the next page, um, so when we think about um, what is eligible margin, right, and what do, what do policymakers intend to fall into scope for, for eligible, eligible margin? So BCBS, uh, IOSCO, uh, issued, as I mentioned back in 2013, um, guidance on how uh, regulators in different jurisdictions should implement um, eligible collateral, uh, uh, collateral eligibility for the purpose of uh, the uncleared margin rules for bilateral derivatives. And I think there's, there's uh, just a statement here again, I apologize, very small on the screen, uh, and a few key points. Uh, first of all, in, in the goal around the scope of eligible, eligible margin, I think it's worth highlighting that IOSCO wanted to lean towards uh, a recommendation for broad collateral schedules. That um, there is a benefit from collateralization in mitigating um, systemic risk, mitigating counterparty risk, but there is also the creation of liquidity risk that goes along with mandatory margin. And in fact, uh, I think we saw that highlighted in John's um, uh, remarks regarding issues the FSB themselves are considering. And one of the ways to mitigate that risk is to have broader pools of high, uh, uh, high quality eligible collateral to mitigate some of those uh, liquidity risks to market participants. And in key principle number four, 
IOSCO kind of outlined, well, what are the types of collateral that should be considered? And, and there's a few characteristics. The first is that collateral should be highly liquid, which both means that you can liquidate it in a re reasonable amount of time, and that in times of market stress, uh, it will hold its values uh, subject to you know, appropriate haircuts. Um, collateral should also not be exposed to undue uh, credit, market, or FX risk, or wrong way risk, so sort of complex risk. Um, and the, uh, this was sort of not, um, uh, and I don't have a particular quote on this, but the IOSCO did also state that they're explicitly leaving um, the scope of eligible collateral up to individual jurisdictions to implement because they wanted to have broad principles that could keep pace with markets, changes in markets, uh, mm -hmm. and allow for different implementation in different markets as uh, conditions and markets change. So if we go to the next slide, um, so the CFTC in 2016 uh, took these IOSCO principles and then defined uh, a scope of eligible collateral. And as you can see, it is, in fact, quite, quite broad. It, it ranges from cash and uh, government debt to uh, corporate credit and even, and even equities with appropriate haircuts to um, uh, deal with potential market risk related with these forms of collateral. Uh, the CFTC also included uh, securities in the form of redeemable securities in a pooled investment fund. So clearly the, the CFTC had considered uh, and approved the use of instruments you know, su such as money market funds um, that uh, are investing themselves and holding high, collateral, high quality collateral. Uh, and as mentioned, I think the, the issue that we'll discuss in more detail later on is, is just a lack of uh, clarity around whether or not the CFTC intended for ETFs to meet this particular category. Uh, I'd also like to highlight here that the UK and EU uh, UMR regimes uh, permit ETFs as rel eligible collateral in those jurisdictions. So um, in that version of, of UMR, USITs, which are the uh, primary form that ETFs uh, uh, take in, in Europe, are ex explicitly uh, uh, permitted as uh, eligible collateral. So if we go to the next slide. So uh, US Treasury ETFs uh, meet uh, I believe that the key principles outlined by IOSCO and also I believe the, the goals and requirements of the CFTC itself and their implementation of the uncleared margin rules. You know, first they are in fact uh, highly liquid uh, and US ETFs can be easily liquidated uh, and there's kind of multiple layers of liquidity that we'll discuss later, both in the uh, secondary markets trading on exchanges themselves, as well as the ability to redeem uh, ETFs for their underlying um, for the underlying assets they hold, which would then give one access to primary market liquidity for for government debt. Uh, they're not subject to complex risk or undue FX risk or market risk. And uh, as noted, you know, I think approving. Um, uh, or explicitly acknowledging that U.S. ETFs are, U.S. Treasury ETFs are eligible collateral would be consistent with a market-driven approach to determining the correct scope of eligible collateral. So we go to the next slide. So not only would approving U.S. Treasury ETFs as eligible collateral be, you know, consistent with the principles of um, IOSCO, uh, it would also create benefits for the pledgers and receivers of collateral, and we think for market stability more generally. Um, the first benefit is around diversification. So as a market participant who's potentially receiving collateral, if you receive a, a treasury ETF, you're re really receiving um, risk to a basket of bonds. So you're receiving uh, risk that is diversified over many individual QCIPs, which means that you're less exposed to uh, the idiosyncratic risk associated with any one QCIP. And so we can think about uh, the issues that occurred uh, around the government funding crisis, how individual T-bills uh, that were looking to mature around the time uh, where there was a suspected potential government default, those actually traded at a dislocation to other T-bills. That's the, the type of risk that can come uh, with taking in just a specific QCIP. Allowing market participants to receive diversified baskets in the form of an ETF uh, mitigates some of that idiosyncratic risk that comes with taking an individual QCIP. 
there's also benefits to liquidity. And so um, obviously this is aligned with the IASCO uh, principle that we just discussed, but also, of course, to entities that are receiving this form of collateral. Uh, it's very easy to, to liquidate treasury uh, ETFs. And that's because of the multiple layers of liquidity that, that exist for, for, for ETFs themselves. Uh, ETFs themselves are, of course, uh, exchange traded. So you can liquidate them by accessing uh, all to all markets uh, where the uh, ETFs, uh, buyers and sellers can meet without necessarily needing to go through the pipes of intermediation and taking up the balance sheet of uh, you know, the dealer community. Um, but then there's also the ability, if um, there's any dislocation uh, in the uh, uh, secondary uh, markets, to access the liquidity of the primary markets. And that's by uh, using uh, APs. So there are entities that have contractual rights to take baskets of ETF share or you know, blocks of ETF shares, uh, submit them to, uh, the, the ETF, to the ETF for redemption in, in kind in the actual uh, underlying securities. And then uh, market participants could take these underlying securities to the primary markets for uh, you know, US treasuries, which themselves are very deep and liquid, and liquidate assets, uh, uh, liquidate securities that way. Um, in addition to the liquidity efficiencies, um, there's also gr a great deal of operational efficiency. So if you wanted to post uh, a, a set of diversified bonds uh, and not use uh, an ETF, you'd have to source all those QSIPs individually, uh, and then you'd actually have to manage that basket. So that's more individual transfers of securities back and forth between market participants. Uh, there are um, also issues related to just managing the cash flows uh, associated with uh, the bonds themselves, as well as the uh, issues related to managing substitutions and maturities, all things that are kind of handled by the ETF wrapper uh, themselves. So this isn't to say that all market participants should you know, exclusively be using ETFs, but I, I think there's a use case here, and it's one that, that we actually kind of ex experienced when we were going through the implementation of UMR ourselves, which is that there are numerous market participants that might be you know, equity funds that trade derivatives and are subject to the uncleared margin rules, and they hold cash uh, as a liquidity buffer. But they're unable to post that cash as initial margin. Uh, for those types of entities, it might be much easier to go buy an ETF, uh, that, um, a treasury ETF, and post that as collateral instead of having uh, you know, an equity PM uh, start managing uh, a portfolio of T-bills, right, which does come with risk and requires expertise. Uh, now, in our firm, we have a big global reach and a lot of expertise, and we're, we're able to um, find uh, you know, partnerships with other you know, portfolio management teams to kind of take on the management maybe of a, of a portfolio of short-dated treasury bills. But the, not all market participants have the benefit of our scale and diversification of expertise. And uh, this is a real, a real world example, I think, where giving market participants access to treasury ETFs could uh, make things less risky and more efficient for them. Uh, then moving on to market stability, you know, as, as discussed, right, the, the scope of eligible collateral uh, and broader eligible collateral schedules does create uh, uh, some protection against the liquidity shocks associated with mandatory posting of margin. And we've also seen that ETFs themselves tend to perform very well during periods of financial stress that uh, due to the transparent nature of the equity markets on which they trade, um, the multiple layers of liquidity that in times of stress volumes often go up actually in the trading of ETFs themselves because there is an easier outlet for uh, liquidity. And we also have seen uh, in markets sort of this virtuous cycle of modernizing the way fixed income uh, liquidity is, is provisioned, uh, where we're, you're able to tie the liquidity of the all tall markets back to the liquidity for the underlying bond markets through the create and redeem process for ETFs. And that this uh, uh, you know, makes ETFs a very important tool in the toolkit for managing uh, liquidity uh, and managing fixed income exposures and will help continue to modernize the uh, uh, treasury markets themselves. So to, to move on to the next slide for just a couple examples of how ETFs have performed in specific uh, times of financial stress. Uh, the first example here is for is TLT, which is a, uh, an ETF that is uh, tracking a basket of uh, roughly 20-year Treasury, uh, U.S. Treasury bonds, and looking at its performance during uh, sort of that March 2020 sell-off period, uh, kind of the COVID uh, quote-unquote liquidity crisis. And as we can see from the, the chart on the very bottom left, 
we compared the bid ask spread, so the cost of transacting in the ETF, to the cost of uh, transacting in the same basket of Treasury bonds held by the ETF. And uh, as we can see, there's pretty consistent low bid offer uh, spread uh, between the ETF and the Treasury bonds themselves over time. Uh, but that when we hit uh, the crisis period in 2020, we saw a real spike right, in the uh, bid ask spread for the 20 year Treasuries themselves, and a spike, but a much smaller spike. Right, and the bid offer spread for the ETF itself. And part of that is going back to the, the way the Treasury markets operate today, where uh, transactions in the underlying bonds themselves generally have to occur between clients and end dealers. And that means that when dealers' balance sheets are clogged up, it may be harder or more expensive to transact in the underlying bonds, and that ETFs, due to the all tall nature of the equity markets on which they, they operate and the transparency, as we, as we discussed, uh, may be uh, uh, an easier avenue for liquidity, uh, uh, to seek liquidity in times of stress. And we see that in the right-hand chart, too, how the volumes uh, themselves spiked both in Treasury markets but also uh, really dramatically in the ETF itself uh, during that, that period of, uh, uh, of liquidity crisis when market participants were, were looking for more efficient uh, ways to uh, move risk uh, in duration. If we move on to the next slide, uh, we're looking now at a different crisis. This is the trading activity around uh, Silicon Valley Bank and using the example of a short-dated uh, Treasury uh, ETF uh, that, that really is tracking a basket of bills. Uh, and I think it's a, it's a similar story here. We can see, again, very consistent liquidity uh, provision in, in terms of, uh, as represented by bid offer spread, uh, uh, bid-off spread between uh, the ETF and the um, underlying basket of bonds. Uh, but uh, when during the crisis itself, uh, when, the, when markets became much more expensive uh, relatively to transact in in Treasury markets, the uh, ETF maintained a very low cost uh, from a bid offer spread perspective. And uh, just to give another stat, you know, one, one of the reasons um, why uh, there's this efficiency to ETFs is that you can have a great deal of transactions, uh, unlike a standard mutual fund, in the ETF itself where it doesn't lead to the actual basket of bonds being bought and sold in the market. So I think we looked at a couple treasury ETFs and found that you know, maybe for every you know, $3.50 of transactions in the ETF itself between market participants who are looking to move risk, there's only actually about a, a dollar of actual creations or redemptions in the fund. So you're able to move a lot of risk without a lot of, um, uh, uh, of, the, of actual transactions that might clog up dealer balance sheets. So moving to the next uh, and, and final slide. So just re returning to the recommendation. And uh, there is an actual uh, memo that I believe that all GMAC members uh, received that has more detail from uh, a, uh, about the nature of ETFs, how they operate, kind of the legal analysis around this recommendation. Uh, but I just wanted to, to touch on one, one critical component here. So uh, when we think about uh, ETFs being eligible collateral under the existing rule, um, and fitting into the, the category of uh, being a fund that has um, redeemable securities. Um, we, we think that um, the CFTC issuing this clarification would in, you know, not only reflect the realities of how uh, market participants through authorized participants are in fact able to redeem securities, so it is inherent to the ETF um, structure itself, but also would align with uh, an interpretive approach that the SEC took in another context. Uh, back when the SEC adopted the uh, ETF rule, um, this is uh, Rule 6C11, uh, the SEC uh, indicated that they believe that ETF shares are most appropriately classified under the final rule as redeemable securities within the meaning of Section 2A32 of the uh, 40 Act, and that ETF should be regulated as open-ended funds. And so I, I think that this would... Um, issuing a clarification that ETFs uh, are eligible collateral on the basis that they have redeemable securities would be highly consistent with the approach that other regulators uh, in the United States have taken. So just to return to why this all matters, you know, we think uh, that market participants benefit uh, by having access to uh, you know, a, a universe of eligible collateral that gives them greater choice to uh, operate in a risk-diversified and operationally efficient manner. 
uh, and that markets themselves benefit when we have broader collateral schedules and when we uh, are able to align regulation with the innovations that are occurring in markets. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you. That was very helpful. Um, discussion, questions before we move to a vote on the resolution? I had one question, Michael. Really good presentation. Did the committee, and if so, what was the dialogue around the approach to haircuts and whether haircuts would be treated differently than the underlier? So that's, that's a great question. And um, as you could see in the uh, CFTC's uh, 2016 margin rule. The haircuts for uh, funds with redeemable securities is unspecified. Um, now, that I believe has been addressed by the commission in the uh, current rule proposal around uh, money market funds. Uh, and this is uh, actually, I think, discussed uh, uh, by the technical uh, issue committee in, in the prior uh, GMAC, uh, that, the, uh, that essentially there was an administrative error. There is a footnote um, that was supposed to be in that chart that indicates that the correct haircut would be essentially a look-through approach. You look at the, the uh, open-ended fund vehicle, and you look at sort of a weighted average uh, of the haircuts for the assets they're holding. So for Treasury ETFs, all of the assets that they hold are themselves eligible collateral. And then you can look at the uh, haircut table, which is sort of a, a floor, I guess not a ceiling on what market participants might agree, uh, and use that to determine the, the, correct, uh, the correct haircut to apply. Uh, and so we endorse that approach. We think that look through is, is appropriate and that more holistically throughout the regulatory and uh, I guess commercial sphere, we should really be treating fixed income ETFs like credit uh, risk, like treasury risk, uh, uh, at the risk of their underlyings rather than uh, treating them as uh, you know, equity risk just because they happen to trade on an equity exchange. And was that unanimous in the, in the working group? Yeah, so that, that was discussed, and everyone was sort of comfortable with that approach. Mm -hmm. I think the key is understanding uh, the, the transparency into the ETF holdings themselves so mm -hmm. that market participants are able to make that determination of what the appropriate haircut should be. Yeah. Um, we have two questions in the queue. Uh, first, Brad Tully, and then Chris Perkins. Thanks, and uh, less a question and more a, a statement of uh, support from uh, J.P. Morgan. So given the growth over, over recent years within the fixed income ETF ecosystem, we do believe it's an appropriate time for the industry and regulators to consider the eligibility of U.S. Treasury ETFs uh, within the collateral framework for non-cleared uh, derivatives margin. As noted in today's presentation uh, and recommendation, the use of U.S. Treasury ETFs could bring significant benefits to the swap market uh, and swap market participants and broader market stability by enhancing diversification, liquidity, resiliency, and efficiency. As Michael noted, the ro robustness of fixed income ETFs has been demonstrated in periods of market stress over recent years, including during the market volatility at the outset of the COVID pandemic uh, uh, at, at which you know, uh, ETFs were instrumental tools in providing liquidity and price discovery. The FRB also turned to those ETFs during this period as a, as a way to efficiently allocate capital uh, to the credit markets. We do recognize that there are additional steps required to operationalize the use of US Treasury ETFs uh, beyond today's recommendation. Uh, such as putting in place the infrastructure to post and receive ETFs into margin accounts and the ability of third-party custodians to handle ETFs amongst eligible collateral. Nonetheless, we believe that today's recommendation is an important step forward given the benefits it could bring to the range of constituents within the swaps market and to the market stability more broadly. Thank you. Thanks, Brad. And, and just as uh, that reminded me of an important second part of our proposal that we didn't really spend time on, which is that there are additional steps required to uh, make the actual use of Treasury ETFs broadly uh, accessible to all market participants, uh, which is the, um, you know, that the prudential regulators that also oversee a large number of swap market participants would likely need to issue similar guidance for the industry to get comfortable, which is uh, one of the reasons the second component of our recommendation is to ask and you know, try and empower the, the CFTC to assist in those conversations with uh, other U.S. regulators to seek broader alignment. Thank you. Uh, Chris, and then Isaac Chang. Hey, Michael. 
Excellent uh, presentation. I look forward to voting for it. And I really appreciate um, your discussion around the look through um, into the underlying assets. Um, statement I wanted to make was as follows. Um, we are also um, experiencing a world where tokenization is taking hold. And this is another uh, example of being able to look through uh, the underlying token into the underlying asset itself. And I just hope that the commission will look at this similarly, and, and, and I'm hopeful that they will provide clear, uh, consistent guidance um, that the tokenization representation will be supportable um, through various collateral regimes, whether it's uncleared margin or CCP accessibility. Thank you. Thanks. Isaac? Hi, I, I had a, thank you very much, and, and thank you, Michael, for the presentation. Um, I had a question and then an, and, and maybe an observation. I guess the question I had, Michael, and, and I think broadly, I, we would feel like your, your presentation was very logical and clear and, and not that controversial, but is there a definition of what exactly constitutes a treasury ETF? Like, does, do treasury ETFs, like structurally, uh, what per, is there a percentage of, of assets that they have to hold in underlying U.S. treasuries? Uh, does it exclude any particular type of treasuries? I guess, strictly speaking, I understand uh, the, the argument that treasury, that, that there should be the look through the collateral and the collaterals, the, uh, uh, the underlying securities in the ETF, and, and if the underlying securities are eligible as collateral, then the ETF should be treated similarly. But I'm just wondering, first, is there actually a sort of strict definition of what constitutes a treasury ETF? Um, like if, if um, is there a certain percentage or if there's a certain, uh, or it has to be 100% in treasuries or, or, or if you think that the, the um, well, you know, where, where, did the, where, where is the limit here in terms of what constitutes a treasury ETF? Great question, and and just to to clarify, maybe maybe there's two answers. One is the the you know answer in terms of a you know the next step from a policy perspective, and then uh, you know, maybe a bigger question about other work that we might want to take on in, in terms of future recommendations. Um, so we're we're advising uh, on a technical basis that the existing category uh, of eligible collateral, which is for securities in the form of redeemable securities in um, pooled investment funds that invest in qualifying assets as defined in the uncleared margin rules themselves, that that, that already predefined category be expanded to include um, uh, fund structures that are exchange traded funds. So inherently, if you um, ex say that yes, ETFs can be treated as funds with, uh, with redeemable securities, those ETFs would be subject to the limitations in the existing uh, UMR rules which define really the, the pool of assets that the uh, uh, fund may hold as sort of being limited to, I believe, U.S. Treasury securities, um, cash, uh, and we can kind of pull up the, specific, the, the specifics um, uh, in more detail. Uh, but we're not looking to expand on that category. So the restrictions on the underlyings that uh, a fund could hold are already pre predefined. Um, but Isaac, I think your, your question does lead to um, another question that the market structure subcommittee might want to take on. And are there other types of exchange traded funds which uh, could serve as eligible collateral beyond right what is uh, recognized in the the existing limitations within the uh, the uncleared margin rules? And that would likely require uh, a rulemaking. And so that is something that the market structure subcommittee is looking at. Uh, but it would be um, more than maybe just a simple clarification. And, and things, for example, like corporate debt ETFs, uh, you know, it, it, it would, would really make sense, right, from a policy perspective, potentially, um, because it allows you to you know, post a, a diversified basket of bonds, uh, and kind of manage concentration risk, et cetera. Um, but that, you know, is obviously going well beyond the scope of what's permitted under the rule today. So that'd be sort of a follow-up. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Dave and then Chris. Thank you, Darcy. Uh, sorry, oh, Darcy, just one, oh, one, one, um, one follow-on comment, oh, sorry, if I might, Isaac. before, before uh, we move on. Uh, I just wanted to kind of note, um, I particularly appreciated Michael's description of the transparent nature of ETF trading, the, the resulting liquidity in times of stress. I felt like it was actually um, quite uh, an interesting a contrast to what looks like is going to be the next topic on the agenda, the swap 
block and uh, cap size recommendations, where we're potentially talking about uh, not allowing more transparency in the swap market, w where we just spent a lot of time uh, extolling the virtues of transparency and liquidity in the ETF market. Um, point, sorry, that's all, that's all I have. Point taken. Thank you. Dave. Thanks. Um, I wanted to go back to Jason's question uh, just for a second. Um, the, the subcommittee spent uh, uh, a bunch of time crafting this recommendation, and uh, on behalf of the, the FIPTG, I'm strongly in favor. Uh, but the haircut issue, at least as I recall when it came up, um, uh, the discussion I, I remember is that the uh, because this is applicable to uncleared margin rules, that uh, the recommendation does not ask the commission to take a position on haircuts uh, and that each bilateral counterparty collecting the margin would have the purview to set whatever haircut they felt was appropriate to manage the risk. Um, and that further, I, at least I don't recall a, a vote of the subcommittee on any issue around haircuts, so I'm not sure we know whether it was unanimous, although there wasn't, there wasn't uh, material dissent uh, expressed on, on this topic. That's a great point, just to, to clarify here. Um, so uh, the, I think what's in really important for the uncleared margin rules, and, and just for clarification around how they apply, is that the uh, regulatory uh, scope of collateral and haircuts is the universe that market participants may agree to. Market participants are not required, right, to accept the full range of eligible collateral, and they're not required to accept it at the haircuts that are defined in the rule itself. So uh, if you are a market participant and you don't want to take Treasury ETFs as collateral, you are free to not include those on your schedules. Uh, you'd be free to further amend your schedules to say, I only want to take ETFs with over a certain trading volume or whatever risk parameters you think are appropriate to set. Um, that, that's also true for the conversation around around haircuts. That um, I think we were saying we would uh, pass through right the existing haircuts as they would be determined um, under UMR, uh, which. Um, as I described, would really kind of be a look through based on the application of the rule as it, as it applies today, rather than coming up with a new haircut that we would recommend as the standard, but that in no way forces people to take the collateral or to take it at that haircut. They could, that is a floor, uh, I believe, on the haircut, not a, not a ceiling. And Chris, I think uh, you're getting the last word here. Uh, last word, but I'll also keep it brief. Uh, I just wanted to, um, uh, first of all, uh, applaud the excellent work of the, uh, of the subcommittee in this space. I think the analysis that Michael presented today uh, and the papers that uh, attended that were excellent, touched upon uh, a number of uh, really important points, and I look forward to, to voting in favor of the proposal. I, I just make the point that I think it, it reflects um, an evolution in terms of the market use of ETFs and the attendant liquidity and diversification benefits, which uh, Michael touched upon in the in his presentation, um, I think are, are factors that strongly commend uh, supporting this proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we've now discussed the recommendation at length, and oh, I'm sorry, Commissioner, I didn't know if you wanted to make a comment at this point. Sorry. Um, and uh, is there a motion from this body to adopt this recommendation? Motion. So we have a motion from Brad, and I need a second. Second. Great. Okay. Um, it's been moved and seconded. Any final comments? Knowing that we're already a little half hour behind schedule, but don't want to restrict debate at all. Uh, committee members ready to vote, and um, the motion is to adopt the Market Structure Subcommittee's recommendations on U.S. Treasury ETFs as eligible initial margin under uncleared margin rules and submit this to the Commission for consideration, for consideration as a point of order. A simple majority vote is necessary, and I'm going to turn it over to our designated federal officer to conduct the vote. Thank you, Chair Bradbury. And before we start, I just want to also recognize John Horkin um, from LSEG. Um, joining us virtually. So thank you again, committee members. Um, so uh, I, will, I will proceed with the vote. Uh, committee members, in agreement, uh, please raise your hand, say aye. 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 All right, 
in disagreement, please raise your hand and say nay. And those on virtual, please feel free to uh, toggle the raise hand function accordingly. You just, for those of you on screen, if your hand is still up from voting yes, you need to take it down. Or if you want to vote no, you need to put it back up. But there you there go. There we go. All right. Can't vote twice. <laughs> All right. We have no nays. And then abstentions. All right, please, please wait one second while we tally up the votes and we'll come back shortly. We want to extend particular thanks to the staff of the CFTC for figuring out a much better procedure for voting for this committee. So we greatly appreciate it. And while we work to tally the votes, um, just one quick PSA, uh, because I know there's been um, some really terrific content in the presentations. Um, the, the presentations, as well as the formal recommendations, uh, will be available on the CFTC website um, within the GMAC subpage uh, as of tomorrow. Chair, you have 26 yes votes, zero no votes, and one abstention. So the ayes have it. The motion carries. Um, thank you to the Market Structure Subcommittee for all of their hard work. The motion has been adopted and will be submitted to the commission for consideration. Um, I now want to turn it over to Wendy Yun, who's going to present uh, kind of a follow-up on the swap blocks and cap size recommendation from our prior meeting. And Wendy is online. Thank you, Wendy. Hi, Darcy. Thank you so much. Uh, and apologies for not being able to be there in person. Uh, we wanted to provide a quick update to the recommendation that we made at the last GMAC meeting. Um, so in relation to um, the block and cap sizes, the GMAC uh, market structure subcommittee continues to believe that appropriately calibrated block and cap sizes are vital to the proper functioning of the US derivatives markets and that the increased block and cap thresholds that will take effect this July, on July 1st, um, do not properly strike the right balance between market transparency as well as liquidity in certain swap categories. Um, as such, the subcommittee has been actively working with other market participants, such as the swap data repositories and swap execution facilities, in order to try to gather data and attempt to perform the data and driven analysis necessary in order to determine what is the appropriate or suitable uh, block and cap sizes for each swap category in each asset class. So we hope to come back um, to, to the GMAC with any further updates based on that analysis. As we highlighted at the last meeting, we, we in the broader industry continue to further evaluate the available data, but we ourselves cannot replicate the, the, the good calculations and analysis that have been performed by CFTC staff. So the subcommittee would therefore ask um, and appreciate the opportunity to get, engage with CFTC staff to discuss our findings and questions related to the calculations and methodology, as well as the potential impact on liquidity especially in light of other factors right now that also may impact liquidity in the derivatives market, such as the increased capital requirements under Basel III. So more to come from our group, but we did want to reiterate our, our continued concern in this space and, that, and the continued work being done by the subcommittee. Thank you, Wendy. Um, I know the CFTC staff is always very open to discussions with market participants in particular obviously GMAC committee members, so I'm sure that they will uh, make themselves available for further discussion. Um, thank you, I think that is, um, we were gonna take a quick break. Uh, we're a little behind schedule, so not too much chatting, 
Um, and hopefully we'll get back in here and do our um, next subcommittee presentation before um, we break for lunch. Um, so we'll, we'll plan to reconvene at 12.15 uh, back in the room and online. Thank you. Um, I would now like to welcome everybody back from that short break for the third item on our agenda today, which is uh, consideration of technical of the technical issues subcommittee's recommendation. Um, I'll hand it over to Allison Lurton and Charles DeSimone to present uh, the recommendation on the publication of a T plus one resources document. Allison. Thank you, Amy. Um, and thank you, Commissioner Pham, for sponsoring all the effort that's gone into building up to today, and also to you, Harry and Nick, appreciated your help. Um, and finally, to my co-chair, Tara Cruz with ISDA, who is in Asia, so can't be here in person, um, but she spends quite a bit of time helping us move things along, so I want to make sure I point out her contributions. Uh, the person that's contributed most to the recommendation to be presented is Charles DeSimone. So I'm really glad he's here in person. I think a lot of folks around the table have spent quite a bit of time already on the transition to T plus one. Um, but we also thought there might be, because of the makeup of this committee, lots of different perspectives or questions that remained about um, the impact to adjacent asset classes or global jurisdictions. Um, and so for that reason, Charles made the suggestion for the paper that is now coming to you for vote as a recommendation. And he has some slides that'll help kind of summarize what the recommendation itself, what the paper, which is a resource document, includes. So turning it over to you, Charles. Great, thank you very much. And if we could move to the first slide. Before I get into the um, proposal itself, I do want to um, reiterate Allison's thanks to the commission and the commission staff for their help in getting us to this point, and as well to the subcommittee members who provided a lot of great input and perspectives to make sure the document really covers the issues that are of most relevance to people. And I think as Allison laid out at the outset, there's a lot of people who've been spending their entire day jobs focused on the T1 transition. On the other hand, there is a broad number of people whose perspective, I think, has been either of kind of tangential awareness of it or perhaps a misconception that that since they are not participants in kind of the core securities markets in question in the classic way, that this is not necessarily relevant to them. And I think the purpose of the guide really is to help people who are either coming new to this or may not fully understand the impacts on it, to really understand, A, what is the scope of what is happening in this transition, to understand that it is not just a US transition affecting one asset class, but it is affecting a lot of different products. It is also an international transition in the UN, Canada, and Mexico in parallel. And it is really also setting the foundation, likely, for a review of settlement security settlement cycles more broadly in other jurisdictions. And as well to really think through about if you are coming for the first time to understand what this is happening and what this means, to start to think about where it may impact your businesses, products and processes, which are either occurring in your organization or are occurring in your clients, counterparties, and market infrastructure providers you work with. So our hope, the goal is a resource for the members of the committee to share with clients and counterparties, and as well for the broader world of market participants um, to understand this major change that is happening in the securities markets. Um, everything in this guide is designed to build on work which has already been done at the industry level to prepare for this transition. So as I go through this and in the document you all have received, our goal is wherever possible to provide links to more detailed resources that have been developed and approved by industry bodies. The transition to T1 really is an industry effort, which is being driven, um, of course, through SIFMA, through the ICI, and with the leadership of the DTCC, but has also involved a number of other trade associations whose products are impacted as well. Um, the Association of Global Custodians, the GFXD, uh, the FX Professionals Association, ISDA, the FIA, and others, and where appropriate 
appropriate, uh, this document draws on their resources as well. So our hope is that this is a very timely meeting with the transition date for T1 coming up over Memorial Day in the U.S., that the release of this document following the meeting today will provide a resource for the industry to build on as they make sure they understand what is coming and have a runway of at least three months to prepare for it. So if we could move to the next slide, please. Um, I'll just give a quick tour of all of you have the document itself. So I'll just give a quick tour of the highlights of what we aim to cover in the document and the purpose of them. So one of the key themes in the document is really to provide an introduction and an overview. Um, I think often people hear T1, they may make assumptions on what's covered, really to scope out what actually is impacted. Um, obviously, at a foundational level, that's what is the transition, what are the rules that are in play, and what's the SEC's decision um, which authorized the transition. Equally importantly is to understand the scope of what is actually moving. Um, I think often people sometimes just assume that it is purely affecting um, U.S. listed equities. Also to note a number of other products that are in scope, corporate bonds, UTIs, mutual funds, ETFs, ADRs, um, and associated products as well. And similarly, the corollary, I think, is to understand what products are not changing their settlement cycle. So there is not a mandate for a change in securities-based swaps. There are a number of exemptions associated with the underwriting process. And of course, um, U.S. Treasury bills, bonds, and listed options are already T1 and so are not affected. So laying out those kind of basic scoping questions. Similarly, to help people understand what the benefits of accelerated settlement are and why the industry as a whole has chosen to make this change. Um, the key benefits, of course, being reduction in risk through shorter settlement times, capital efficiency through um, reduction in margin requirements held at the DTCC complex, and as well as general move towards efficiency as market participants move towards faster processing times and straight to processing, um, which are necessary for the accelerated settlement time frame. And finally, kind of laying out what are the ways in which market participants will be affected. We talked later in the document about some of the specific product and process impacts, but to really kind of give a lens of, as you users of the guide look at their organizations to say, how, what does it mean broadly? And that's, I think, to think about terms like the impact on compression of time frames. Compression of time frames, as particularly as it intersects with business operating hours and with time zone issues, as it interacts with certain legacy processes which may have been designed towards different operating time frames or are dependent on processes which may now need to be accelerated. So kind of to help people get this perspective on what it means and how they should be preparing for it. Um, if we move to the next slide, I think another key element, as I mentioned at the outset, is that this is a international transition. So to outline what markets are moving alongside the U.S. on Memorial Day and provide some detail on those changes. Um, so we do provide information on the decision made uh, by the Canadian Capital Markets Association to move in parallel over Memorial Day weekend and provide information on the full set of securities in Canada which are moving and the resources they are providing, as well as to provide information on what is happening in Mexico, given that they have formally announced their decision to move on May 27th as well. So participants who are active in those markets understand that context. Um, we also highlight that we are expecting a number of other um, Central and South American markets to move alongside um, the U.S. later in the year, although that has not been formally announced. The other element to this, which we wanted to make sure people were aware of, is the policy process which is beginning in the UK and the European Union around a reassessment of settlement cycles in those markets um, and to provide a introduction and link to what is happening in the process out of HMT in the UK and out of ESMA in the EU and when to expect um, some potential uh, recommendations and decisions in those markets. So moving then on to the next slide. 
Great. So in addition to thinking broadly about the impacts on the markets as a whole, we wanted to highlight and provide resources on a number of specific products and processes where the industry feels arguably the transition will have the most acute impacts and firms need to be the most prepared. Um, and really then provide a link to the resources that the industry has developed around those areas so they can make sure that if you are active in these areas, that you and your teams are prepared for them. So I'll just quickly highlight some of them. Obviously, trade affirmation, allocation, and confirmation processes are ones which are um, moving to a same-day cycle and from the current T1 cycle and are, unlike some items which are purely dependent on what's happening within a firm's four walls, are dependent on interactions and inputs from clients and counterparties as well. So we provide information on the rule changes, 15C62, how that affects broker-dealers and their count buy-side counterparties, as well as RIAs, and as well thinking about meeting those new regulatory requirements, what are some of the best practices that firms have begun to implement, what are some of the target affirmation rate goals, and how firms should be preparing to get there. Similarly, securities lending, another area in which um, those interactions among market participants used to be able to be executed with a longer time window, thinking about um, what will happen now that there is an expectation that they be executed by 1159 on T of to trade, um, and thinking about where there are exemptions for that, what are the process impacts, and what you need to be doing with your vendors and clients. Similarly, collateral management, um, another area in which there is need for greater efficiency. We outline a number of the operational impacts and some of the steps which market participants in the industry work around this area have already begun taking so that people who are coming new to this can understand how they should be organizing themselves as well. Um, it also perhaps of interest to this group are the impacts on OTC derivatives. We note the regulatory context for the OTC derivatives world um, and noting that although considering as well the potential to uh, move securities which reference in-scope securities to accelerate the settlement of them, even if it is not formally mandated, um, thinking about what that would involve, what those product types are, and as well as highlighting the work which ISDA is having underway through its own equity market infrastructure group to likely in the future issue a preferences grid to help firms as they make those decisions. Similarly, we also outline a number of considerations around the securities lending market um, and those challenges. If we move on to the next slide, please. Great. So the next item we wanted to talk about in the guide is on cross-border impacts. And I think this is perhaps of particular interest to this group. And we highlight two particular areas in here and provide a number of resources for the industry. The first of these really is the FX markets implications. And kind of in relation to some of the themes I touched on before, um, the interaction between this really combines a lot of those challenges in that it combines time zone impacts, dependence on other product and process timelines, and dependence on market infrastructure, which does not operate on the new T1 settlement cycle. So to help firms think through what this means, as well to um, counteract some of the misinformation that is out there. I think there has been some misconceptions, which SIFMA and others have heard, that T, the interactions with the FX timeframes and infrastructure present a major challenge to the move to T1. I think following analysis by CLS and a number of trade associations, including the GFXD, there was a determination that, in fact, the number of impacted transactions as a share of total CLS that would be impacted is less than 1%. We highlight that analysis. We also highlight some of the best practices which have been developed um, through for FX professionals, for users of the FX infrastructure, and in connection with CLS to really, A, demonstrate that this is a manageable impact 
and to think through how you should be preparing um, for you to work with your clients where FX is an element of securities settlement. Um, in addition, thinking through some of the cases where this may be a particular challenge and how to address that, such as clients in Asia where those time zone issues are particularly acute. We also provide guidance for the impacts of foreign listed securities in the U.S. Um, this is a somewhat complicated area where this is building on guidance which was previously put out by the Commission. We provide a number of detail and a number of scenarios in the document um, for the number of trading volumes in the U.S. of the foreign listed security, where it's listed, and then how that affects its um, settlement requirements under SEC Rule 15C61. I would like to note that the industry, as of Friday, has published additional guidance on this area, um, which we will be updating in the document to provide links to that new information, which has been reviewed by the regulatory community. So um, generally consistent with what you see, but we'd like to note we would like to make a slight update to it to have it re revise the link before publication. Finally, um, we have additional, if you move to the next slide, please. Finally, we have a number of other resources, which kind of once, the goal I think of this is once readers of the guide have identified what T1 means for them, where they need to be thinking and preparing for it, to kind of point them to what they need to move further along on their readiness journey. Um, and some of the key resources here, I think, are the extremely detailed industry playbook, as well as documentation that the DTCC has put out, its FAQs, its documentation, and information on how to get integrated into its testing framework so firms can rapidly um, get up to speed if they are in turn indeed needing to prepare for this transition. And finally, we do have a resource as well highlighting a number of key markets and products in other jurisdictions and illustrating what their current settlement cycles are as a kind of at a glance resource for firms to think about how this transition may impact other products that they are active in and other markets and where there may be um, adjacencies, potential impacts, or efficiency opportunities. So that wraps up really the contents of the guide. As I mentioned, we hope this is a resource which is suitable for everyone from people who are, have been ignorant of the transition to people who are in the process of figuring out what it actually means for them and is designed to get them to a point where they are ready to for a smooth transition over Memorial Day. Great, thank you. Um, thanks to Allison, Tara, Charles, and the Technical Issues Subcommittee for creating a helpful resource for the industry. Can't think of a better way to welcome summer 2024. Um, this, this is a, a major industry transition um, impacting both securities as well as related markets um, and with further global implications um, to bear. And so, um, you know, I, I do think that it's important to ensure that all market participants are informed, aware, and prepared. Um, at this time, I would like to open the floor to questions and comments from GMAC members. Um, please um, turn your tent cards sideways um, if you would like to, to, to ask a question or make a comment. Um, we'll start off with Chris Perkins, um, who is joining us virtually from CoinFund. Am I on? Awesome. Thank you so much for your comments and uh, really respect and appreciate the work you've done. I was particularly drawn to the comments you made um, that this movement to T1 will actually result in a, a reduction of risk and also deliver an enhanced capital efficiencies. And you know, when I was running uh, one of the largest derivatives intermediaries in the world, um, these, these issues really resonated, particularly with the flow of collateral. Um, my question is, how do we get from T1 uh, to T0? And you know, we, we appreciate that now we have technology that allows us to deliver it. Um, so it, it, I don't... Chris, if you could, um, if you could hold on for just a minute, we, we lost your audio feed.
uh, while, while we wait for our AV to, to be restored, uh, we'll, we'll go to Dave Olson in the room from FIA PTG. Thank you. Um, just a quick um, clarification. The one, the one bit I wasn't sure I was as crisp on when I read through it was the CLS analysis saying that less than 1% of their daily transaction volume would be uh, affected uh, by the move to, to T plus 1. Um, obviously, their historical transaction volume has been in a T plus 2 context. Um, either I didn't quite get what data of theirs they were analyzing, or, or I might not have understood the point. Can, do, do you have more information about what data they looked at and, and how they came to that conclusion? I do not. I've been, it has been released. Um, I believe in the guide we have a links to a number of resources that were put out um, through the GFXD's T1 paper, and they include um, the detailed statistics around um, analyzing why they, the share involved is particularly low. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll take a look at that. Thank you for that for that reference. And the reason I bring the point up is. Um, in speaking to other market participants and, and members of the PTG, uh, the and you call this out very nicely in in the update, uh, the participants in Asia that are trying to buy U.S. dollar denominated instruments uh, and and handle the FX conversion, um, it appears to us as though uh, really the only avenue to continue those transactions is to pre-fund the dollar leg and have that staged. Um, obviously, if you know what you're going to do, there's just a cost involved. I think the trickier problem is markets are so dynamic, it's tough to know what to pre-fund the day before. You don't know what you're buying or, or selling. So I think that that's got particular focus for us. Yeah, it's a great point. I think that's one of the challenges. And I think particularly for that subset of the market um, where the time zones present that challenge, I think pre-funding is a, uh, the best alternative, although perhaps not an ideal one. And, and by the way, we're, um, we're proponents of moving to T plus one um, and moving all markets uh, uh, up uh, so that they can be better synchronized. Thank you. Um, I, I understand that we are back up and running with our virtual participants. Um, Chris Perkins, let's let's try this one more time. Yeah, I, I don't know where I left off, um, but my question is, you know, I really appreciate the work you've done with the industry to move it um, forward in this direction. I appreciate it as well. The comments around how a movement to T1 will reduce risk and enhance capital efficiencies. Uh, my question is, how do we move forward from here? And I, I appreciate we haven't even gotten to T plus one yet. But what are the obstacles standing in the way of getting to T0, which I think will further build on, on these uh, reductions in risk and enhanced capital efficiencies? Sure. Happy to give some context on uh, from the SIFMA perspective and our members' perspective on why T1 um, and arguably the contrary to that is why not T0. Uh, a number of the issues, particularly as we walk through the product and process impacts, really at, the, at this time, there is not really an easy way to handle particularly securities lending transactions, FX impacts, um, all of these areas. Um, or prime brokerage areas, the time, the kind of the intersection of those issues as the processes exist today, coupled with time zone dependencies, coupled with client communications issues, coupled with different levels of maturity, automation, et cetera. Those are obviously very large markets in which an institution which may have extremely sophisticated same-day processes is working with a range of clients with different levels of automation in different time zones, in different regions. And I think the sense was that it really was not at this time realistic to have an overall industry transition to T0, um, given the disruptions it would present to the broader world of adjacent products and processes. Um, arguably, there was discussion of whether there's potential future operating models for those areas. I think as they exist today, there is no operating model for a number of those areas at scale which could support T0 settlement. And so we felt that T1 was a realistic goal 
which drives major reductions in risk and major reductions in efficiency, um, but is also achievable based on current technologies and which builds on existing processes and products without entailing major disruptions. I think there are a number of areas where individual market participants may choose to explore T0 solutions for certain subclasses of transactions or um, with certain counterparties. And there's a lot of exploration in the ledger-based space around that. Uh, but I think our members' view strongly was that T0 was not appropriate at this time, um, given it's the lack of preparedness and the lack of any infrastructure really to support the disruptions it would entail. Yeah, uh, thank you. I'm happy to talk to you about infrastructure that can perhaps enhance your processes with you and your members, but I'll reserve any further comments. Great, thank you. Um, if there are no further questions or comments, um, do we have a motion to adopt this recommendation and submit the recommendations to the commission? So moved. Thank you. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you. Uh, the motion on the floor is for the GMAC to adopt the technical issues subcommittee's recommendations and submit them to the commission for consideration. A simple majority vote is necessary for the motion to pass. I will turn it over to the DFO to conduct a voice vote. Thank you, Chair Hong. Committee members in agreement, please raise your hand and say aye. Aye. All right, thank you. Uh, in disagreement, abstentions. Virtual participants could put their hands down. Thank you. And Chair Hong, the ayes have it. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, the ayes have it. And um, the technical issues subcommittee's recommendation regarding the publication of a T plus one resources document, document has been adopted by the GMAC and will be submitted to the commission for consideration. Um, we will now take um, a, an abbreviated lunch break um, because we are running behind schedule. Um, we, we will plan to reconvene at 1.30 um, for, for both in-person as well as virtual participants. 1.30, thank you. Uh, welcome, everyone. We're going to restart our meetings today. Appreciate everybody's promptness coming up and down those CFTC elevators. Um, so we're going to have a very interesting panel discussion now on the um, impacts of Basel III on our derivatives markets and kind of thinking about all of the connections. Um, we have a panel. Uh, we're going to spend about half an hour I'm not anticipating we'll have time for discussion, but hopefully there's a lot of uh, diverse views on the panel, so you'll appreciate that. We have uh, Reggie Griffith, who's on uh, the Zoom, and Dan Gallagher, Gallagher, Elizabeth Kirby, and Joseph Huang. Is everyone here? Yeah, good, great. Oh, there you are. All right, thank you. Um, I think, is Reggie gonna kick it off, or who's starting on your panel? I didn't think I was starting, but I'm here. I'm, I'm ready. Well, it, I leave it to the panel then. Thank okay, you. Yeah. I will. I will kick things off. It's uh, um, I'm Joseph Huang um, from Goldman Sachs. Uh, members of the committee, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. My name is Joseph Huang. Uh, I am the head of the U.S. regulatory policy team at Goldman Sachs. Um, my team and I are responsible for the firm's regulatory capital interpretations and policies. I'm here today on behalf of the Futures Industry Association, the FIA. Uh, as well as the International Swaps and Derivatives Association, ISDA, uh, which will collectively represent both cleared and OTC derivative market participants. I will provide some background on two recent proposals from the Federal Reserve, FDIC, and the OCC, 
the first is known as Basel III Endgame, as you noted. Um, and the second is on the proposal on the Global Systemically Important Buffer, or GSIB, for sure. And I will speak to the significant increase in capital requirements expected for the largest U.S. banks and the impact that will have on the broader derivatives market. So the Fed, FDIC, and the OCC released their proposals in the summer of last year. The proposed rules represent a comprehensive rewrite of the regulatory capital standards that the biggest banks are subject to. Every activity that a bank engages in will be impacted. And the goal of these new standards was to harmonize international capital rules without substantially raising the aggregate amount of capital. Uh, but despite the original goal of not substantially raising the aggregate amount of capital, the Fed, FDIC, and the OCC estimated a 19% increase in capital for the largest banks. Industry estimates are even higher and closer to 30%. This is despite the consistent statements from Federal Reserve Chair Powell that the U.S. banking system is sound and resilient with strong levels of capital and liquidity. In addition, rather than harmonize the capital standards internationally, it will create further divergence. For example, the EU and the UK anticipate only a 3.5% increase in capital. If we wade into the details of the proposals, we find that the proposals are most impactful to capital markets activities, with derivatives, both cleared and uncleared, among the hardest hit. Because many derivatives are required to be cleared by law, and most end users are not direct members of a clearinghouse. They rely on banks or futures commission, commissions merchants, FCMs, to facilitate their hedging needs. And over the last 20 years, the number of FCMs has decreased significantly, with US banks being the predominant providers of clearing services. For example, as of July 2023, nearly 85% of all swap client clearing was conducted through only five US GSIBs. Notably, the clearing markets have shown itself resilient through multiple stress events and yet, this activity is among the most penalized within the proposals. Based on a study by the FIA and ISDA, these proposals would increase the capital costs associated with client clearing by more than 80%, nearly doubling the capital requirements for this activity. There are three aspects of the proposals that I would like to highlight that drive the dramatic increase, none of which reflects the benefits and values of clearings. First is related to GSIP. The proposal requires client clearing to be included in the measure for complexity, one of the five measures of systemic risk. In effect, the proposal takes the view that clearing activity increases a bank's systemic risk and complexity. Meanwhile, US policymakers have promoted clearing as a means to do the exact opposite, to reduce both systemic risk and complexity in the derivatives market. And as a result, the proposal will raise the minimum capital requirements for all of a bank's activities. And I would note that the U.S. is the only jurisdiction that has taken this approach. Second, and in relation to the Basel III endgame, banks will be required to hold credit valuation adjustment or CVA requirements uh, for client cleared derivatives. However, this is in contrast to the fact that banks have no risk of CVA losses on client clearing activity, a point that has been recognized in Europe, uh, which exempts client clearing from the new CVA capital requirements. And finally, the third item here, also within the Basel III endgame, banks will have to hold more capital to the extent that a bank is transacting with a non-publicly traded company. This is despite the fact that being public or private has no bearing on credit worthiness. Again, European banks do not have this requirement. With each of these items, there is a clear competitive disadvantage for US banks and their clients. If the rules are finalized without change, we believe this will have the effect of higher transaction costs reduce market capacity for cleared derivatives, and more activity moving abroad. Similarly, uncleared OTC derivatives, which allow corporations to hedge their bespoke business and operating risks, will be meaningfully impacted by the CBA requirements as well. Industry estimates show that the capital requirements can increase by over 10 times for uncleared derivatives with corporations. Europe has once again exempted transactions with corporations and pension funds from the CBA requirements to avoid disincentivizing prudent risk management and hedging practices. And finally, I would note that these concerns go beyond the impact to derivatives, as the largest US banks will no longer be able to engage in the same lending and intermediation activities as they do today. These proposals would therefore undermine the overall strength of the US capital markets. Thank you for your time on this important issue, and I'd be happy to answer any questions.
Um, do other members of the panel have uh, presentations or, yeah? <clears throat> Thank you. Thanks, Darcy. Um, thanks, Commissioner Pham and the GMAC for having me today. I'm Liz Kirby, Head of Market Structure for TradeWeb. TradeWeb broadly supports regulatory capital rules that are appropriately calibrated to support market functioning and the safety and soundness of the banking system. However, we urge that any rulemaking is approached with caution to avoid negative impact on the functioning and liquidity of U.S. and global financial markets. By way of background, TradeWeb is a leading global operator of electronic marketplaces for asset classes including rates, credit, equities, money markets, and derivatives. Founded in 1996, TradeWeb provides access to electronic trading, data and analytics, straight through processing and reporting for more than 40 products across institutional, wholesale, and retail marketplaces. Our role is to help make these markets more efficient, and our network of users includes banks, investors, trading firms, and retail advisors, amongst others. While TradeWeb itself is not a banking organization directly subject to the Basel III rules, we do have a unique vantage point and an interest in maintaining well-functioning markets. We're concerned that significant increases in regulatory capital requirements for trading activities could have harmful effects on important financial markets, U.S. market participants, and the U.S. economy. Well-functioning financial markets require a diverse set of participants to ensure deep and liquid markets, but meaningfully higher capital requirements could reduce or even eliminate the ability of certain banks to act as liquidity providers. This could have the unintended consequence of lower liquidity overall and greater dependence on less highly capitalized market participants. We urge policymakers to seriously consider the global markets landscape so as not to impose capital requirements that are significantly more onerous in the U.S. than those being put into place in other jurisdictions. Failing to pursue an objective of harmonization could result in U.S. markets and U.S. banks being disadvantaged relative to their peers in other jurisdictions. In a similar vein, we remain concerned about regulatory-driven fragmentation, in which markets in different jurisdictions may offer the same asset class, but with wildly different liquidity profiles and economic terms. I'll touch on a few asset class-specific considerations, beginning with cleared derivatives. I'll note that counterparty credit risk mitigation through central clearing has been broadly endorsed by global regulators, and the use of central clearing continues to increase in response to market trends and regulatory mandates. However, both the GSIB surcharge proposal and proposed CVA capital requirements would result in higher surcharges and increased capital requirements for banks facilitating access to clearing, including for instruments mandated for central clearing. In addition, I'll note U.S. GAAP does not recognize CVA for these exposures, and other jurisdictions, including the EU and the U.K., have either excluded or proposed to exclude these exposures from their CVA risk capital requirements. Market participants and regulators have already noted recent decreases in the number of firms providing clearing services, and we know from our participant base that concerns around clearing capacity are growing. Proposed Basel rules could further inhibit bank participation in clearing, leading to increased concentration, increased costs to end users, and potentially a contraction in market participants' access to clearing services. I'll touch on treasuries for a moment. Liquid U.S. Treasury markets are essential to global financial markets and the overall economy. Regulators, including the agencies putting forth the Basel III proposals, have recognized that maintaining deep and liquid U.S. Treasury markets is a core policy objective, given the centrality of these markets to financing the U.S. government, implementing mon monetary policy, and setting prices for a range of financial instruments, amongst other things. The ability of bank dealers to provide liquidity in U.S. Treasuries is critical in all market conditions, but the consequences of illiquidity are particularly acute during times of volatility or market stress. The market disruptions at the beginning of the COVID crisis in March 2020 clearly illustrate this issue. Regulators, academics, and market participants have acknowledged that liquidity pressures in these markets at the time may actually have been exacerbated by bank capital requirements with widespread consequences for financial markets and the broader economy. It's important in all markets and asset classes to consider the consequences of any rulemaking in the context of other regulatory initiatives. This is particularly topical for the U.S. Treasury market, which has been the subject of several re recent legislative actions by the SEC. 
Last month, the SEC adopted a rule to expand the set of participants required to register as dealers. In the Treasury market, this will have a clear impact on proprietary trading firms who are viewed as critical sources of liquidity in this market. In December of 23, the SEC published a clearing mandate for repo and cash Treasury securities. This is a transformative piece of legislation that will impact Treasury and repo market structure in many ways which are not yet defined. My earlier comments relating to the Basel III impact on clearing capacity are critically important against a backdrop of a Treasury clearing mandate. Given the criticality of these markets, we strongly urge the official sector to carefully consider the aggregate impact of these various rulemakings and avoid imposing regulatory capital requirements that could exacerbate liquidity shortages. Funding markets, including securities, borrowing, and lending, as well as U.S. Treasury repo, are essential in supporting and enhancing overall liquidity and functioning of financial markets. Money markets are a foundational component of U.S. capital markets, permitting companies to fund their growth and U.S. workers to save for retirement. We urge regulators to carefully evaluate how capital requirements could affect bank participation in these important markets and to ensure that there's a clear understanding of any related downstream effects. For example, if not appropriately calibrated, minimum haircut floors could impact the ability of banks to engage in funding transactions and provide liquidity in both cash and funding markets. It's noteworthy here again that other major jurisdictions, including the EU and the UK, have not proposed a minimum haircut floor. I'll touch briefly on ETF markets, an important and growing market for both institutional and retail investors. Excessive calibration of capital requirements for equity investments in ETFs and the inclusion of ETFs within the definition of a financial institution uh, for the purpose of interconnectedness could reduce bank participation in ETF markets in a way that not only decreases liquidity, but could increase costs for market participants, including retail investors. Lastly, I'll mention some concerns related to the mortgage market, specifically with respect to mortgage-backed securities issued by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Starting in June 2019, MBS issued by these two agencies were consolidated into a single uniform mortgage-backed security, or UMBS. The intention of this change was to establish a single liquid market for the securities issued by both agencies with a view to improving liquidity in the MBS market. The Basel regulations need to clarify that MBS issued by both agencies will be treated as the same obligor for the purposes of market risk capital requirements. Treating them as two independent issuers could have negative implications to the depth and liquidity of the residential MBS markets with potential implications to the cost of residential mortgages and to the U.S. housing market. Once again, we support appropriately calibrated regular, regulatory capital requirements that contribute to the stability of our banking system and bolster the functionality of U.S. capital markets. However, we remain concerned that the Basel III framework, as proposed, risks overpenalizing the U.S. banking system, which would likely have an impact to U.S. financial markets liquidity and could negatively impact the functioning of these markets, particularly during times of stress. We urge regulators to consider the potential impact of these regulations in the context of other regulatory reforms that are currently being proposed or already adopted. The loss of bank market making capacity, particularly in critical markets like U.S. Treasuries, could result in diminished liquidity and hamper the functioning of this essential market. Lastly, we believe rulemakers should consider jurisdictional differences in Basel III implementation to avoid market fragmentation and ensure that U.S. banks and financial markets are not unduly disadvantaged relative to other global markets or foreign domiciled banks. I appreciate having the opportunity to share our views with the GMAC today, and thank you for having me. Uh, Commissioner Pham, members of the committee, uh, thank you for inviting me today to uh, on the discussion on the proposed Basel III endgame regulation and its potential unintended consequences on bank customers, uh, particularly non-publicly traded entities. Uh, my, <coughs> excuse me. My name is Daniel Gallagher. I'm the Director of Commodity Sales and Trading at Basin Electric Power Cooperative in Bismarck, North Dakota. I'm speaking today on behalf of Basin Electric Power Cooperative and as a representative of the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association. The National Rural Electric Cooperative Association is a national trade association representing nearly 900 local electric cooperatives and other electric utilities. And we share an obligation to serve our members, providing safe, 
reliable, and affordable electric service. The United States' electric cooperatives are owned by their members and operate at cost and without a profit incentive. From suburbs to remote farming communities, electric cooperatives power one in eight Americans and serve as engines of economic development for 42 million Americans across 56% of the nation's land landscape. Basin Electric is a not-for-profit generation and transmission cooperative that provides supplemental power to 141 member cooperatives across nine states. We serve over 3 million electric consumers and our members service territory comprise of over 550,000 square miles. We are concerned that the proposed rule and its requirements that large banks hold more capital requirements for transacting with non-publicly traded entities, including electric cooperatives, will make effective risk management and lines of credit more difficult and expensive for electric cooperatives. And this is without materially improving the risk management for the banking sector. Specifically, we believe that the proposed rule will have serious consequences for our ability to execute the, execute the contracts necessary to have a successful risk management program, which is vital to hedge market and price risks. As an example, as part of an electric cooperative's risk management program, a cooperative may purchase natural gas in advance on a long-term basis and at a fixed price and use this for its natural gas power plants. This fixed price fuel is then essential to protect the electric cooperative's financial position since the electricity market's price is often set by the spot price of natural gas. Therefore, if spot natural gas prices spike, the electric cooperative's purchase price of, electri of electricity often spikes higher as well. However, in this scenario, the natural gas hedge financially protects the electric cooperative and its member consumers from higher electricity prices as it generates electricity using the lower fuel price. This example can and does occur, such as during winter storm Uri in February of 2021, when some natural gas markets traded for over $300 per MMBTU in what normally was an approximately $3 per MMBTU market. If electric cooperatives are unable to secure the appropriate financial instruments to mitigate their market and energy price risks, then these costs will be financially detrimental to people and businesses across the United States. As a result of these regulations, our large bank counterparts would face increased capital requirements for such transactions because electric cooperatives are not publicly traded. In turn, large banks may be less willing to participate in such transactions, or at a minimum, increase our cost for participating in the transactions to cover the additional costs imposed by stringent capital requirements. Electric, co electric cooperatives will incur increased costs simply because we are not publicly traded. Importantly, if these regulations result in less participation in these commodities markets, liquidity will be reduced. Consequently, electric cooperatives and their members would be unable to adequately protect against price spikes that occur during frigid winter or hot summer weather, which may lead to electric rate increases or more severe forms of financial distress. Electric cooperatives serve 92% of the nation's persistent poverty counties. Our members cannot afford undue electric rate increases, particularly when those rate increases could have been avoided. We know research demonstrates that well-conceived and executed hedging policies mitigates risk. However, effective risk management programs also rely on well-functioning liquid commodities markets. The proposed regulations would jeopardize these markets. For over 80 years, electric cooperatives have responded to the needs of their communities and adapted to numerous challenges to meet that commitment. The Basel III endgame regulations are being proposed to reduce systemic risk in the financial markets. We believe the regulations will have a negative impact on our and the electric sector's ability to hedge commodity and interest rate risk, thus increasing price risk for our consumer owners. We take exception to the public listing requirement as electric cooperatives are not listed on equity exchanges 
and do not present any additional credit risk to banks. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today, and I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Dan. Thank you for coming all the way from Bismarck, too. We appreciate it and providing a very different perspective on the impact of regulations. Um, really helpful. Uh, Reggie? I think you're our last speaker, and then we'll have some time for discussion once each of you is presented. All right, can everyone hear me okay? All right, my name is Reggie Griffith, and I really appreciate you guys having me uh, here today, and I apologize I couldn't make it in person. Uh, I'm the global head of regulatory compliance for Louis Dreyfus Company. Louis Dreyfus Company is a global agricultural merchant and processor, and we're very active in the cotton, grains, oil, seeds, sugar and coffee markets. Also, I've been discussing these proposed regulations with other agricultural companies through the Commodity Markets Council. When people think of a commodity merchant, they think of a middleman buying commodities from producers and selling them to end users. This is true. However, what many people do not realize is one of the main functions of a commodity merchant is to absorb risk. Both the producer and the end user lay off risk to the merchant. And one of the primary ways that we manage these risks are through the futures markets. Therefore, any changes to these markets and the clearing firms that offer access to these markets can have a material impact to the agricultural system. That is why I'm here today and, and why we're concerned about the potential unintended consequences of these regulations on the futures markets and the agricultural system, particularly the increased capital charges on US bank owned FCMs. One thing I think I wanna make sure everybody understands before I go into the potential consequences is, we talk about the number of FCMs and I realize I think there are over 40 active FCMs out there that are registered. But when you look at FCMs that are actually active and available and willing to handle large merchant business, we're probably talking about 10 or less. And four of them are the, four of the largest ones are US bank owned FCMs that will be hit by these increased capital charges. So as far as the consequences, um, you know, I think best case scenario would be an increased cost to the merchants to manage the risk. With that said, these costs could significantly go up and, and are not gonna stop at the merchants. The costs are gonna be passed along uh, and they're gonna lead to less money for farmers, higher costs for consumers. However, I really feel that this is a best case scenario. What we are really worried about is that merchants and the ag industry as a whole will not have access to the clearing services required to properly manage their risk. Many times we are way too focused on ensuring firms don't have too large of a position. However, the real risk is that firms don't have the capacity to put on enough futures to properly manage their risk. This is when you really inject risk into the system. So if we step back to the Basel III implementation of capital charges uh, from the, the original implementation, merchants were probably some of the hardest hit customers. You know, you have to realize we have very large positions and relatively low volumes compared to other types of participants. Therefore, we were, we were particularly hard hit by increased capital charges. And I think if we have a further increase, we're going to be uh, e even harder hit here. So you, you have before these regulations went into place, I mean, we were a top tier client. People were always calling, they were begging for your business, they were talking about lower rates. After the Basel III increased capital charges went into place, the calls completely changed. It was about higher rates, it was about, can we diversify your business? Can we take on less business? Could you split it up into between multiple clearing firms? Um, which is why we're very concerned that if these potential rules go into place about our business in the agricultural sector really having the capacity to put on the futures that are needed to properly manage risk. Also, we are at a dangerously low level of FCMs that can even handle large com commercial or even institutional business. I I'm not going to blame this all on Basel III, but what I will say is if we lose any more large FCMs, I really believe the entire FCM exchange clearinghouse model could be in jeopardy. And, and these new rules could potentially push one or more large bank owned FCMs out of the business. Also, my last comment, I realize that we're talking about banking regulations, but I think these regulations could have a severe impact on the futures markets. 
With that said, I think it is very important that the CFTC is at the table as we discuss these regulations and then the implementations of the regulations going forward. I really appreciate the opportunity um, to be here and discuss this, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. And thanks to the, all the panel for the presentations and the different perspectives. Um, discussions, questions for the panelists? Uh, I see Chris. Hey, thank you so much for your thoughtful um, comments. Reggie, I've got a question for you. You know, I, I, I also share the concern around the impact of Basel Capital on FCMs, and we've seen a material, um, I guess, elimination of FCMs across the market over the last 20 years. Um, it, it's a business that I know well. Um, in the absence of an FCM, do you think a direct model where you would face a CCP direct, provided you were afforded some of the benefit, the, the identical benefits, is that a viable alternative if, if these Basel rules continue? I think it potentially will be where we are headed. Um, the problem is though, I, I think there's only a finite number of commercials that have the capacity to do it. I think that's one problem. Two is I, I think you remove a, a level of risk management. I mean, right now we have the FCM, we have the client, we have the FCM, we have the exchange, we have the clearinghouse. Uh, I think when you remove one of those levels, uh, you know, you potentially are gonna inject more risk into the system. But I, I do think that direct clearing or, or potentially even, you know, uh, the exchanges or clearinghouses stepping up and clearing directly or, or where we may have to go um, if we see a further reduction, especially of the bank owned FCMs. Thanks. I, I wonder, Dan, if you have a, an interest in that question, do you think your members could do direct clearing without an FCM? Uh, I think it's a, it would be a challenge. Uh, it's certainly, uh, you know, whether we're talking about ex through exchanges or off exchange and bilateral transactions, I think either way, we're, uh, we have the same challenge. Um, and, and many of the markets that are, we transact in uh, for, on behalf of electric uh, cooperatives, mm -hmm are not necessarily highly liquid markets. And so that, that's another component of this uh, regulation that presents a serious challenge to us. Uh, many of these are illiquid markets, whether it be regional natural gas markets or regional electricity markets. Uh, and there's not a lot of liquidity there. So um, any hindrance to, uh, to the existing liquidity it presents major challenges. John Murphy online. Thanks very much. Thanks for uh, your comments. The, the entire panel, I think, was, was excellent. Um, so my question would be more around hedging and um, what uh, hedging might look like if prices do increase again. We saw, I would say, extreme markets in 2022 um, based on what was occurring in Europe, particularly around gas. Uh, and we did see margins increase across exchanges. So prices uh, rose significantly for exchanges and at that point and, and for FCMs and, and then users as well. At that point, I think we reached um, um, a situation where um, different firms decided not to hedge some of their portfolio that they would normally hedge. Um, what kind of a risk do you think that presents to the overall marketplace um, where we see unhedged markets in uh, environments that would normally see uh, fully hedged? Who would, would any of the panelists like to tackle that? I can start. Uh, I, I agree that um, this would uh, propose, this proposal would also provide any uh, additional challenges during times of price volatility. Uh, in addition to the points just referenced, there's also the concern about raising capital uh, and the ability to do so cost effectively. Uh, this proposal does hit at the heart of that as well. And it does have some real impacts across the country. Um, for example, in the electric sector, uh, the ability to, to raise capital is, is vital because in electric cooperatives, uh, we are heavily financed through ca uh, debt capital. We don't have, unlike a publicly traded 
uh, investor-owned utility, uh, there's not a, a direct access to equity there. Um, so any of those additional costs through price volatility in the markets are then passed along to the end consumer. Uh, and any increases in the cost of capital, likewise, uh, are either results in the possibility of having less reliability in the electric grid or resiliency. So there's a lot of different impacts here, not just in terms of from uh, a consumer's bill and the price volatility that would result, but also in uh, the reliability from the actual products. Thank you. Yeah, John, can I add to that as well? Please. I do think we've seen, you know, obviously all of our businesses are very competitive and anytime the, the you know, costs go up, I, I think especially with the small to medium sized players, um, you know, the tendency is, you know, sometimes to maybe not be fully hedged. Uh, and, and I think that as costs go up, that risk goes up even further. So I, I do think your point about you know, injecting further risk into the system through the increased uh, cost is definitely there. And, and also, I mean, we, we've both been in the clearing business, I think our whole lives, we, we know, you know, today the, the clearing capacity that's there for even the large firms is not nearly what it, it's ever been in the past. So I think cost is, is one aspect of it, but I also think, you know, even if they're willing to take on the fees, I, I'm maybe even more concerned that the capacities there for them to, to put on the, the hedges they need for sure. Yeah, it was very interesting in um, the European markets when as a result of the invasion of Ukraine, um, obviously energy markets in particular went, um, became quite volatile and the higher margin requirements had a real impact on utility companies. And so the European Union stepped in and actually said, no, banks have a role to play here. and and kind of change their approach uh, to enable customers, you know, to access lines of credit from banks to meet margins in volatile times. So it's, uh, uh, I think it was, um, uh, it was uh, Joseph's uh, initial presentation where you talked about kind of the trade-offs between wanting to promote clearing, um, and that's been a huge uh, thrust of global policy uh, around derivatives since the financial crisis, and yet, do we really recognize always all the benefits of clearing as they filter through other things? I think we have just a, a couple more minutes. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Thank, thank you, Darcy. Um, just to follow up on a couple of these comments and the regulations that are being put forth, which really could have devastating effects, even more so than what we're talking about. So if we break it down really quickly, the small FCMs, have no ability whatsoever to absorb the level of business if any of the large FCMs leave. And so not only does it leave you with the potential of unhedged positions, which increases market risks and default, but at the end result of that is that really people will quit making markets because when they reach their certain level of risk capacity, no matter how big the merchant or trading firm is, they'll stop. And so then our producers, our users don't have the ability to lay that off. But it doesn't stop there, because then as we move into the FCM community as you go forward, don't forget the FCM share capital and default risk, right? Now, when you start to take that larger capital out, we clear ourselves. But now, if you start to remove that as a percentage, we start to take more and more risk within that clearinghouse to where it is. To at some point in time, our risk people tell us, no, we're not going to take the risk. So even the self-clearer then gets pulled out because of the level of risk that he has to take. And the domino effect keeps all the way down, down the line. Eventually it hits liquidity, eventually it hits the volumes that goes through, and eventually it's the producers and the end users in all cases. So the whole idea to try to move things to a clearing, clearing and exchanges in order to be safer, this does the exact opposite, removes it from the markets, and literally without the big FCMs, the model will actually fail, and the exchange themselves can't be a self-clear because they don't have the capital either. And Commissioner. Well, I want to thank the panelists so much for the presentations. They've left a, a deep impression upon me, and particularly being able to hear from our commercial end users who, of course, are the reason why we have the derivatives markets to enable the risk transfer that allows them to do what they do in the real economy. So I wanna thank you for taking the time to be here. What I'm hearing from, again, uh, from, from our electricity producers, from our 
uh, merchants that support uh, our, our growers, um, that there is a call to action for the CFTC. And I appreciate that because the last time we had policy making that involved the SACCR uh, and the impact that might have had on access to clearing, uh, the CFTC did engage uh, with the prudential regulators uh, on that issue. And I believe that ended up in a place that was better for the clearing ecosystem. Um, so hearing this call to action, what would uh, you, any of the panelists or any of the GMAC members suggest that the CFTC do next? Uh, is this something that should be discussed at the FSOC? Should there be some type of uh, joint roundtable with other regulators? Uh, should the CFTC send a letter? Uh, I really welcome uh, any input from, uh, from the public on this issue. Yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> I mean, I, I really do think, um, uh, I know the CFTC has been engaging um, with staff from the prudential regulators, but I think anything more public is important because it is these, it's these markets that will be impacted. And I know you've been, Commissioner, um, a great spokesperson on this issue and panels and in public forums, but I think more of the, you're right, the action of roundtables, letters, on the record um, would be very impactful. So we support all of your ideas. <laughs> well, and that's why regulators put proposals out for comment, is to get comments, right? You don't necessarily get all the things right the first time around. Um, all right. Well. Um, it's been a terrific discussion. I want to thank our panelists. Um, you missed out big time, Reggie. You missed the sandwiches at lunch. And we're sorry you're not here, but we really appreciate all the panelists coming in and giving quite distinct uh, impressions from the different angles of the marketplace. Very helpful. Great. Yes, th thank you. Um, very, very timely, um, especially given, uh, given the hearing today and, um, you know, all of the industry um, feedback uh, in response to the proposal um, just a number of weeks ago. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, with that, um, we are now ready to move into our fifth and final topic for the day. Um, I'd like to turn it over to Caroline Butler, Sandy Call, Adam Farkas, Diana Barrero Zayas from GBBC and Ninand Nurgudka from BCG to present the, the Digital Asset Markets Subcommittee recommendation on digital assets taxonomy. That was a mouthful. Yeah. <laughs> I think it proves it takes a village. Um, I appreciate we're standing between a lot of trains, planes, automobiles, so we will try and be as efficient as possible. Um, this is our very first recommendation, so we're very excited um, to bring this to bear. It also serves as a core foundation for other recommendations that we will make over the course of the next coming uh, months. Um, but before I introduce and hand over to Diana and Adam, um, I just want to say a sincere thanks. Um, it really did take a village. Uh, the committee came together very well. Um, we do have quite a diverse committee across the digital and traditional players um, in Digital Asset Committee. Um, and that diversity um, infused a lot of very good debate. Um, and I think we came up with a very thoughtful uh, work product as a result. Um, I also want to say a huge uh, note of gratitude on behalf of myself and um, Sandy, to Alison Parent and to Sandra Rowe. Unfortunately, they couldn't be here today, um, but they did a tremendous amount of work navigating the different uh, perspectives through to this work outcome. So I think we all owe them our gratitude for that. And obviously to BCG, um, who were very, very, very helpful in terms of providing a structure for us um, to progress to this point as well. Um, a good friend of mine always says, words make worlds. And we are hoping that these words will make regulations where appropriate. Um, they will help navigate us to the places where regulations actually already exist. And we don't need to make new regulations. There may be tweaks that are needed, but we will definitely use this taxonomy as a core product to be able to determine what within the level of specificity that exists within the use cases for digital assets or the actual assets themselves require new regulations or tweaks to existing regulations or maybe actually fall outside of regulations. Um, so I think that's going to be a very next uh, key next step for this. 
Importantly as well, this is just the start. So I think taxonomies should be viewed um, as an evolving product. Um, the breadth that we will start to cover as this industry evolves, we talked about it earlier, uh, evolution is probably a mild term for digital assets and the speed at which it is evolving um, and also the depth that we'll take this taxonomy through to um, will be developed over the course of the next couple of months. So without further ado, I will hand over to Adam first who will walk us through the definition types. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Caroline and Sandy, for your leadership in supporting the development of the digital asset classification approach and taxonomy recommendations for the, uh, for the subcommittee. As discussed, the key value uh, is that diversity of experts represented on, on, on them has analyzed collectively to provide guidance on the underlying features of digital assets, the, introduces a framework on how to categorize digital assets, and provides baseline definitions under each category of the relevant assets instruments to reinforce the category approach. Um, I, will, um, I will start the presentation with some definition issues um, and, and, and some considerations that, that were taken on board when, when developing these recommendations. Can we go to, to the second, next one? So um, the definition of a digital asset, which was used for the purposes of, of, of this taxonomy, is that a digital asset is a controllable electronic record where one or more parties can exclusively exercise control through transfer of this record and where the controllable electronic record itself is uniquely identifiable. Excluded from the definition of digital assets are those controllable electronic records that exist in and function solely as a part of a financial institution's books and records. The economic fu functions of, of digital assets uh, may serve a variety of, of, uh, of economic functions as a store of value, medium of exchange or payment, means of investment or trading, or a utility to access other goods, governance, or other services. We, the, the group also looked at um, assets with existing regulatory framework, and I think um, Caroline already made uh, reference to, uh, to this. Within those economic functions, when those assets have a characteristics of regulated instruments that do not qualify as digital assets, a specific regulatory framework may already apply, and the subcommittee believes that digitalization does not, as a legal or practical matter, alter the functioning of the product or service with the result that it's unnecessary to look beyond the existing classification for the regulated instrument. Also, um, the subcommittee looked at some key features beyond the economic function of the, of, of the beyond the economic function of the assets. Given the nature of digital assets, regulators and standard setting, setting bodies should consider key features beyond economic function to classify these assets and to determine what regulatory framework, if any, is adequate. This is similar to how frameworks such as those that are used for classifying a security or financial instruments already apply today. And lastly, um, there was one important consideration, which was a caution about classifying assets by network type. Uh, the subcommittee recognizes the importance to not classify digital assets by reference to the type of database or network type on which they are issued or recorded. Doing so is inconsistent with how financial instruments and non-financial instruments today are classified and could have unintended consequences for the application of market regulations. So um, the, after these, these um, considerations, the value of the framework which is put um, in front of you, recommended uh, to, uh, to GMAC to adopt, is aimed to assist both policymakers and market participants to engage effectively and to work collaboratively as markets continue to innovate. To illustrate how the framework works, in the appendix of the document, the DAM has provided a collateral use case as a reference as well. Right now, I would like to pass the floor to uh, Diana from Global Blockchain Council, who will now provide an overview of the features of digital assets and also walk you through the categories of the framework. We look forward to GM, GMAC members' approval of these recommendations and welcome any questions after Diana's remark. Excellent. Let's go to the next slide, please. Oh. 
It's very important to consider that digital assets can be characterized by specific features which were identified by the group. The first being issuance. Issuance is very important, meaning whether the entity that issues a digital asset or for whom a digital asset is being issued by a servi service provider exists and, and the nature of it. The second being how a digital asset holds value. The concept of being pegged, meaning a market price being referenced to the notional value or amount of a different asset that's based upon, or unpegged, meaning that the price would be free floating, determined by market supply and demand for the asset. The next key feature is how the digital asset would confer rights, meaning um, providing the party or parties that control such a digital asset a legally enforceable claim or rights against the issuer. And the fourth uh, key feature would be fungibility. Is a digital asset, um, is it possible to divide it into individual units that are interchangeable like for like, or is it completely unique, being non-fungible? Um, the next feature would be how the digital asset could be redeemed, meaning the ability to relinquish ownership of a digital asset in exchange for an equivalent value of a different asset class, or whether if no issuer exists, if the issuing entity has, has no obligation to redeem the asset as a consideration. And the final key feature would be how the digital asset is recorded in books and records. Is it a digital twin, meaning um, representation of a traditionally off-chain asset, or is it digitally native, meaning uh, inherently exists uh, on a blockchain? Important issues to consider given these features that were in, uh, identified in the, by the group would be that not all digital assets have all these features. This is an emerging industry and there may be additional features developed over time as innovation continues. And these characteristics and classifications accordingly would evolve. This is just a starting point, and when these key features are present, it may indicate to regulators a way to evaluate these type of assets and uh, use a use case driven approach. And if we go to the next slide, please. I want to speak to where we are today, why it is important, and how does that pave way for next steps. Starting with what we have done in the working group, um, we have put together, like you can see, a categorization of digital assets that helps differentiate among the different kinds. The group has put together the main buckets and subcategories based on the specific features mentioned in the slide before. This is very important, I want to highlight, because this taxonomy reflects the consensus of key stakeholders that have ranged from large global banks to regulatory entities, crypto native firms, and international organizations, who all came together over several months to agree upon different digital asset categorizations and corresponding definitions. It has been a journey that I don't know of any other organization has uh, having undertaken in the way that this working group has. And the output, if it truly reflects agreement and consensus that, that we got to from all the players involved can be extremely valuable for the next steps. We have, as you can see, the digital asset types as the main buckets, the specific instruments related to them, and um, which often have different subcategories. In the future, this consensus-driven categorization and definitions can put us in a position to evaluate as a voice reflective of the industry, the regulatory status of each of these instruments and potential action items. Potential questions to consider could be, do existing relevant regulations apply? Is there a need for reevaluation? And are there novel issues presented by an entirely new offering that may require further interpretation? 
So as we walk through these main categories, um, each has a definition that we uh, have in the annex, and obviously pages five through nine of the actual document have the actual definitions put together. But ultimately, I want to summarize saying that this digital asset classification approach and taxonomy is valuable because it provides insights on the features of digital assets, it introduces a new framework on how to categorize them, and it provides baseline definitions for each category um, and relevant assets and instruments, and this can reinforce a category approach plus a use case driven approach. The framework recommended to the CFTC GMAC is aimed to help policymakers and market participants to really uh, effectively engage and collaborate together as these markets to continue to innovate and evolve. It has taken much effort, and I do want to recognize and thank Allison and Sandra Rowe and the team, and a, a special thank you to BCG for helping us incorporate all the voices that emerged after significant discussions and came to a final agreement. And um, we can move forward to the next slide, which basically has the final buckets, and um, move forward. Thank you to everyone. Great. Um, th thank you very much for the presentation. I, I understand this taxonomy is the culmination of um, a lot of discussion, discourse, um, and represents the views of, of the subcommittee. So I um, really appreciate you taking the lead and putting in the time um, to bring this recommendation to bear. Um, with that, we'll open up to the GMAC for um, questions and comments. Dave Olson from FIAPTG. Yeah, I echo Amy's comments uh, also. It's a, it's a big undertaking. Um, and as I was reading through it, <clears throat> I, maybe the, the part that I would have found the most difficult is coming up with a succinct definition uh, of a digital asset. And in, in thinking about the way that you've described that definition, I'm wondering, because so many financial assets are native digitally now, uh, how, how have you drawn the perimeter around what I know you're talking about <laughs> versus what you probably don't want to be? For, for example, where would US dollars held digitally at the Fed fail in the prongs of the definition? Or Apple stock, uh, digitized Apple stock held at the DTCC? And, and how do you avoid not capturing everything in, in that net? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, these are the kinds of debates that we've had a lot of, <laughs> as you can imagine. Um, I think that the key part, if we can go back to the very first page that had the definition of the digital, this uh, that one, yeah. I, I think the key here is, is that the electronic record is uniquely identifiable, right, and that it is something that is controllable. Uh, and that it does not simply represent a, a, a book or record entry, right? So a digital dollar on the Fed's balance sheet would be just an entry, right? It doesn't necessarily exist as a transferable uh, item. That would become more of a central bank digital currency offering or a type of tokenized dollar if they wanted to issue a dollar, which would be a really a retail type of offering, a retail central bank digital currency. But if it's simply sitting on the records of the Fed, it's really just an internal book and record entry. That's how we tried to think about it. Uh, and as for the Apple stock, you know, the Apple stock being tokenized, that would be a unique record, but typically the entire set of Apple stock would either be tokenized or that Apple stock would be wrapped in a different instrument, which would be a financial instrument, which we've captured uh, under our financial token category. Chris Zolke from uh, DRW, Cumberland. Uh, thank you for that. <clears throat> well, while I'm on the Digital Asset Committee and not on the Taxonomy Committee, uh, but I spent a lot of time thinking about this problem. I just wanted to share a comment. I think the next slide, uh, the one with the variables, yeah. What I found particularly challenging with this exercise was 
the programmatic abilities of assets now. And as a result, the dimensionality of what a digital asset can be is, I don't want to use the word infinite, but it's rather profound. And so when you kind of frame your thinking around how to define and how to introduce a taxonomy, you're, you're kind of introduced with a very unbounded problem. And for me, the kind of the critical approach was to recognize the unbounded nature and introduce the variables that you could use to characterize each of the differentiating features. So I think this framework that we're looking at here, while it's not necessarily ultimately complete, given the pace at which the evolution is taking place, it gives us an extendable framework to introduce the characteristics to define how we look at each individual digital asset as the, the kind of innovation continues over time. Uh, so I'm rather supportive of this, this approach. Thanks, Chris. Are there any other questions or, oh, Chris Childs from DTCC. And then we'll, we'll go to you, Angie, next. Thank you. Um, I, I just have one question, you know, given this conversation, it's definitely gonna revolve over time and this is a, a great start, so very supportive. Did the committee uh, put any thought towards ownership, maintenance, governance of the next steps? Yeah, we're going to uh, outline our, our future approach in a roundtable at the end here. But yes, this is why we keep trying to emphasize that this is the start. Um, we couldn't start to apply any of our recommendations to just a, a generalized, amorphous concept of a digital asset. Um, I think that what Diana had said about needing the classification and the use case together to look at whether or when or if regulation needs to apply was a starting point. So from here, we'll talk about it a little bit later, but we're gonna get now into the details uh, around how you should be thinking about or how we are thinking about all of these different types of assets and where and in what use cases might there need to be some reevaluation. Uh, thank you. Diana, the, 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 the paper and the presentation were really impressive. And for those of us, and it, it, you can tell that a lot of work went into that. For those of us who were not on the subcommittee, can you maybe share one area that caused uh, the, the most discussion and how you resolved it? I think stable coins were a matter of conversation, um, the implications. Uh, and across the board, across the entire paper, every single phrase in many ways, every single word choice can have implications on how the in financial institutions or, or key stakeholders, crypto, crypto firms would be regulated. So there was a very meticulous back and forth on, on how each, and also because we're coming up with definitions word choice like Carolyn opened is, is very, very important. But I can also defer to, to Ninod from, from BCG who really took a part in um, compiling all the voices together. If, if there's anything you'd like to add, uh, please go ahead. Oh, I, I think, Diana, you captured that very well. Um, if one area of the, the report came to mind, it would be stable coins. But I think nearly every single word in this document was meticulously reviewed by the by the subcommittee, and I think it's just a testament to how involved all of the members were, and that it was a indeed a consensus-driven document representing the views across the full value chain. I want to echo the comments of the uh, subcommittee and GMAC leadership in what a tremendous effort this was to really have such a truly diverse set of both traditional and uh, digitally native um, participants. And I think that the quality of the output is, is again, also tremendous, particularly given the socialization and the feedback uh, from uh, not just the members, many of which are global, but also, as I understand it, from international organizations and uh, regulatory counterparts uh, all around the world. So this is something that has been definitely very pressure tested, so I appreciate that. Um, what I found very compelling about uh, some of the, the slides from the presentation were the ones that provided an overview in particular of the financial digital assets, as well as the alternative digital assets, uh, and then the, the crypto assets, aka cryptocurrencies, 
also the functional digital assets and the settlement controllable electronic records, which I think is where much of the efficiency uh, from the use of blockchain technology could be presented, but it should be understood that that is a electronic record uh, keeping function. So I was wondering with the time that we have, it would be possible to have a presentation uh, on the greater detail in those categories if that would be possible. If we go to the annex, I'm happy to walk us through it. The first bucket, one slide before. There we go. The first. Th this part could be fast because I think people mm -hmm. understand this part. There's been a lot yeah. of attention on this part, but the other ones were particularly interesting to me. Yeah, this part is more relatable because of the money and money like. Um, one thing I'd like to highlight first is the importance of, of having a role of uh, being a reliable store of value, medium of exchange, and unit of account. Now let's move to the next one. Then we have financial digital assets and uh, typical use cases, again, would have the role, play a role of financial investments, financial returns, and access to capital markets. We've divided those into securities and other financial instruments and derivatives. And within each two of those um, categories, there's a version of a tokenized security or tokenized derivative, on the other hand, or security token and derivative token. Um, feel, feel free also, Carolyn and, and Sandy and Adam, if, if you'd like to add anything. But um, the tokenized version would be a digital twin token, and then the the actual token would be a digital native version of, of the either security or derivative. Then moving to the next bucket, we have alternative digital assets, which are representations of an interest in a good or a non-financial asset. And here again, we have a tokenized alternative asset definition, which again points to a digital twin token that represents an interest in, entitlement to, or claim on an alternative um, or non-security asset, or, or a claim on the, um, uh, you can see the, the, the definition itself. Um, but one thing important to note is um, certain activities that may perf be performed on a tokenized non-financial asset, uh, this classification category may change. Uh, the innovation is still taking place and developing. The next bucket would be crypto assets where we've um, basically um, merged together the concept of crypto assets and cryptocurrencies uh, under a, a similar concept where typical use cases, obviously, uh, from a network-specific medium of exchange, unit of account, or transaction fees. Um, these could be specul speculative investments and branded uh, forms of a store of value. And this category includes some of the first use cases of crypto assets, Bitcoin, Ethereum, um, they're, plat they're platform based, they're non-redeemable. And again, this, a lot of this points to the features that I explained above and, and how they're um, combined in different ways to produce different kinds of digital assets. And then the other crypto assets, which could be, um, again, non-redeemable digital native tokens, no rights conferred against the issuer, um, and they could be used as um, speculative investments. And um, again, not as all crypto assets, they're not pegged to a reference asset from an external point of view, and they don't represent um, ownership or other legal claims uh, against a company or other type of issuer. And they're also not guaranteed by a regulated financial institution. And then if we go forward, yeah. We have functional digital assets, where this points a lot, a lot of time to the governance or as, uh, access to a specific form of infrastructure, an app, a specific functional utility um, to gain access to, to a network. These functional digital assets are digital tokens that cannot be exchanged for value issued, uh, and they provide the owner of the token with a specific utility, such as um, application specific governance rights, voting, decision making authority, and um, record of entitlement, right to rewards or revenue uh, from a specific application or, or, or community. Again, the, the definitions are there. Um, just want to walk through. Um, 
again, here is also an area where, where we expect uh, the ecosystem continuing to evolve and, and more innovations taking place. The next bucket would be settlement tokens under the bucket of settlement controllable electronic records. The main concept would be uh, tokens that allow digital record keeping for the facilitation of uh, financial transactions, um, the concept of uh, facilitating settlement through a token. And do you? Yeah, I was just going to add, I think, you know, to the point you were bringing out, Commissioner Pham, um, breaking down the assets in the four categories that you mentioned, right? The, so, uh, the security, the financial instruments, the crypto assets, uh, the asset-backed tokens or the asset-related tokens, and the functional digital assets is critical because there has been a complete conflation in many instances between these four categories of assets. Mm -hmm. um, and this is, again, where having this classification is going to help because each of those categories have very distinct use cases, right? And so, you know, having the classification break them out and then being able to match that with the use case is what is going to give us this ability to say, you know, this is clearly something that is not any kind of financial asset, or this is clearly something that is a financial asset, or there's uncertainty here and more investigation needs to happen. But if we, you know, try to treat everything that rides on blockchain rails and can be traded through unregulated exchanges as the same type of asset, we then are doing a disservice in trying to really think about how they should be considered uh, for potential regulation. Because they, they all are really quite different when you get under the covers and think about how they're utilized. I want to highlight as well the importance of a use case driven approach once again. And that's why we start every definition of every major category with typical use cases to provide examples. And I find that the use case driven approach particularly helpful because um, part of what I've been doing in looking at this and looking at different jurisdictions approaches to this is to focus on some of the uh, real economy use cases. What are people actually doing with these things? What are they for? And why is it important to distinguish between commercial activities and financial activities? So for example, with the functional digital assets, uh, it seems to me that this would include um, loyalty programs or reward programs or um, uh, the customer engagement networks for brands, uh, maybe entertainment. So could you tell us a bit more about some of the uh, current uh, use cases around functional digital assets? Because I think this is where a lot of the innovation is happening as well, which is very interesting. Exactly. A lot of the innovations, uh, and we've seen in previous taxonomies the concept of, of utility tokens and how that, that has evolved. But a lot of that concept through access to a network to be able to um, have a right to, to certain rewards that are provided through tokens in many different formats um, that can range from, from anything. Uh, rewards, revenue streams, access to participate in, in, in a game or in a network. Um, it, it, can, it can be anything. So airline miles, hotel points, uh, my favorite coffee place. That's under rewards. <laughs> I mean, if you think about it, we all buy tickets on Ticketmaster today, right? And that ticket that sits in your wallet from Ticketmaster, in a sense, is a functional digital asset. If that was being issued on a blockchain, that asset would absolutely fit into this definition. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I think we have a, a couple more minutes for this session. So really quickly, and I think um, the other area where there's a lot of uh, uh, examination of the efficiency for uh, infrastructure is in the settlement tokens space. So um, is this really, as I understand it, to be modernizing kind of the pipes and plumbing of um, clearing settlement and post-trade processes? Yes, exactly that. So it's moving from cobalt mainframes into something more modern. Um, and we're making the distinction on purpose because that's where it's a true technology play versus the creation of a new asset per se. Thanks. I think that's very helpful as well um, because there has been a lot of confusion 
uh, around some of these different use cases. And so I think this is the one where it's really, if we were upgrading our technology from paper to electronic records, and now if it's a digital token, it's just still a technology upgrade. Absolutely. Great, thank you. Um, Darcy. Yeah. Long day. I wanna go back to the actual um, proposed recommendation for a minute. I don't know if that's possible to do on the screen. I have no idea where it is in the presentation. But um, in talking, I'm just so not a digital native, as the phrase goes. So, But in talking with people about this who also don't spend as much time in this field as uh, some do, um, one of the things that struck me about the the resolution in the presentation was the idea, the acknowledgement up front that this is going to need to be updated and adapted. Um, and so you're not suggesting this is the taxonomy that lives for all time, but that it's a way to begin to create common, um, you know, terminology so you can start talking about the same things, right? Um, so I guess that's how I, you know, as a non-digital native, got more comfortable with this recommendation. And so I just wanted to make sure that others had seen that was sort of literally embedded in the language. Um, yeah, so. and I think that's exactly it. And I'll borrow Chris's term. It's a framework, right? And it provides a way for us to have common language, but more importantly, a common framework by which we can acid test various different scenarios and we can come to then the right outcome because of the nebulous terms that exist today and that conflation that Sandy talked about. It's very important to have something that we can actually run through that framework and say, okay, yes, this actually is, whether it's a digital asset or to Dave Olson's point, it could just be digital representation of something. Um, and we can actually rule it in or out from there. And I think that's very important. So it just gives us some common standards and frameworks to work from. Great, thank you. If there are no further questions or comments, um, is there a motion from the, the committee to adopt this recommendation and submit the recommendations to the commission? Yes, I would like to move it. We've got a motion. Do we have a second? Happy to second. Thank you. Uh, it has been moved and it has been seconded. Are there any additional questions or comments before we move on to vote? All right, the motion is on the floor. The motion on the floor is for the GMAC to adopt the Digital Asset Markets Subcommittee's recommendation and submit them, submit it to the commission for consideration. Um, a simple majority vote is necessary for the motion to pass. And with that, I will turn it over to the DFO to conduct a vote. Thank you, Chair Hong. Committee members in agreement, please raise your hand and say aye. Aye. All right. All right. Thank you. And, vo and those who are virtual, please uh, put your hands down. That would be helpful. Thank you. In disagreement, please raise your hands and say nay. All right, and abstentions. All right, Chair Hong, the ayes have the votes. Great, thank you. The ayes have it and the motion carries. The Digital Asset Markets Subcommittee's recommendation regarding digital asset taxonomy has been adopted by the GMAC and will be submitted to the commission for consideration. Thank you very much for the recommendation and all of the work um, that went into it. Really appreciate it. Uh, and now in our uh, couple of remaining minutes, I was hoping we could ask uh, the leadership of the subcommittees to comment uh, on things you're working on that you hope may be um, ready for our next meeting. Um, I don't know if anybody is prepared to preview their agenda, please. I'll just keep going since we were just talking, um, kind of complete our presentation. So 
Um, we have several work streams within our subcommittee, and uh, we will be coming with recommendations from additional work streams in the future. Uh, we anticipate having in the next few months recommendations from our non-fungible token work stream and our utility work stream. Uh, we have a life cycle work stream that is looking at the pre-trade, trade, and post-trade life cycle. Um, that is where the use cases and the classification that we just presented will be most, I think, helpful in, in helping us to uh, identify where we think recommendations would apply. Uh, and that will become much more detailed, and we will start to build out under some of these classification types uh, additional taxonomy and additional recommendations. Uh, and then finally, we have an infrastructure committee. And we want to really, uh, I think, draw attention to this idea that there are new technologies that are coming into use uh, that may really start to transform the financial market infrastructure uh, over the next decade or more. And we're seeing experimentation with these technologies becoming more and more widespread. Uh, and yet there's still a lot of confusion about these technologies as well. Um, when you think about a term like a wallet, right? A wallet can mean many things in today's world. A, even common definitions that most people here uh, would feel that they understand, like custody, actually means something very different when you start to talk about this new infrastructure. Uh, so what we are also going to bring to the committee uh, over time is a set of recommendations uh, about how to think more broadly about the infrastructure and, and some of the use cases that might be enabled because of this new technology uh, and how that might apply. And, and some of the easiest ones that come to mind to think about is the potential uh, for 24-7, 365 trading using these technologies, or the potential to think about new solutions around KYC AML using these technologies. So we're going to have uh, a set of recommendations or areas for further exploration around the technology, infrastructure, uh, around the asset types and the life cycle, where we will put, uh, based on use cases, uh, the need for discussion or recommendations. And then finally, um, we will continue to build out this taxonomy itself so that all of the underlying definitions that will really help inform the use cases become part of this living document so that it can continue to be really used as a reference and framework uh, for those all around the globe thinking about these same issues. Thank you. We certainly heard that from the FSB this morning when they talked about their work streams as well. Uh, I don't know, um, Michael, if you have. Uh... Sure. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so we've had two excellent uh, panels now on the Basel III endgame. And while there's already a clear sort of call to action, uh, we think that there would still be benefit from uh, putting a recommendation down in writing. Uh, so there's a lot of enthusiasm in the market structure subcommittee for a Basel III endgame uh, slash GSIB surcharge recommendation focusing on the impacts on derivatives, markets, and clearing. Um, that's the only recommendation where we've actually commenced uh, commenced work and we will you know, are seeking to deliver it. There are other areas we are exploring though, so uh, continuing the conversation around the universe of eligible collateral uh, and going beyond what requires uh, simply a clarification of the existing rules to potentially uh, calls for new rulemaking to look at things like, as we mentioned, uh, corporate bond ETFs. Uh, we'll make sure we're not getting too much into the turf of uh, the digital asset subcommittee, but thinking about about uh, potentially tokenized assets. And so there's kind of discussion around what we might put together in that context. Uh, and then also the opportunities to look at open uh, IOSCO consultations, uh, particularly around um, uh, margin and collateral and uh, transparency and whether or not um, we would be well suited to put forward a recommendation for the CFTC in that regard. Thank you. And on the technical issues. Um, thanks very much. We do have a couple of things we're keeping our eye on and wanted to let folks know uh, we're beginning and commencing work on. The first is the Trade Reporting Working Group um, has taken note of the lingering inconsistencies in the global use of identifiers, universal trade identifiers or product identifiers and data, related data standards, um, and are thinking about a recommendation that would ask the CFTC to leverage its leadership role in the global 
CPMII OSCO work to try to drive more consistency and standardization, um, specifically focusing on the consequences of impairing data quality and hindering the ability to aggregate. So that work is underway um, and would likely be coming up for a recommendation. Separately, we have a post-trade process and a separate group on cross-border infrastructure, and both of those groups are keeping an eye on an IOSCA report um, on the working group of margin requirements. Perhaps there's some overlap. But specifically, um, we're thinking of some recommendations of a report encouraging improved use of collateral management and efficiencies that can be found through standardization. So I think the goal there would be possibly by July, on the back of that work, develop further some more finite recommendations for, for adoption. Uh, we do have some other working groups, one uh, on market events that has considered whether um, a compendium or a document that could be used to help where there's a potential intersection with the U.S. debt ceiling again, knowing that that caused a lot of angst in its buildup, and are there preparation elements or ways we can streamline communication from exchanges or others just so we don't have constantly recurring panic. Um, that's a possibility. A related topic is maybe a similar type document or use case, use, uh, use compendium for unexpected market closures more generally, not specific to the debt ceiling. So that's the report from the Technical Issues Subcommittee. Great. Thank you so very much. And I, I would just like to say, um, you know, a big thank you to everybody for um, a very full day um, and, you know, one where we've covered quite a lot, quite a bit of ground um, in a substantive fashion um, with, you know, very good discussion. Um, and so, you know, many thanks to um, the GMAC subcommittee co-chairs, the subcommittee members, um, because there was a tremendous amount of work that went into preparing for today. Um, and of course, to Commissioner Pham and staff um, for convening this group um, where we've had the opportunity to discuss um, you know, such a wide range of important topics to global derivatives markets. And for the final closing remarks, uh, I just think the big takeaway from today is that the GMAX work is having a real impact on the policy approach to developing pragmatic solutions to address the most significant issues in global markets. I have shared the GMAX recommendations to promote the resiliency and efficiency of global markets with international standard setters and regulatory counterparts around the world, and there has been great interest in the GMAX work since it is so aligned with key international priorities of the FSB and IOSCO, as you heard earlier today. I hope that the GMAC recommendations can be considered as part of key international working groups and task forces. Also, I'd like to recognize that the GMAC's work is having an impact at the CFTC already. So for example, the two recommendations from the Technical Issues Subcommittee as it relates to swap data reporting and enhancing the data quality and utility was taken into account in our recent proposal uh, in December, and I appreciate that the GMAC submitted uh, the recommendations to the comment file on that proposal as well. And for the Global Market Structure Subcommittee, there's been a great deal of engagement with the CFTC staff on some of the very live issues, including the swap blocks and cap uh, thresholds um, effective date. And uh, also, I think that there are great opportunities where it's really low-hanging fruit. We should be aligning and doing harmonization uh, with other U.S. agencies like the SEC. And so it's my hope uh, in discussing with the chairman and uh, as we work through those details that we will be able to have a rule proposal that will address um, the SEC registered clearing agencies as permitted counterparties uh, for repo, which will help to improve the resiliency and liquidity in repo and funding markets. So everything you are doing makes a difference, uh, as I said earlier today. And I want to thank you all so much for all of your efforts. All right. Thank you, Commissioner Pham, uh, Chair Hall, Chair Battery. Um, the meeting is now adjourned. Thank you very much, and safe travels. Thank you all.